a, um, I've got a mobile EHU 7250, uh, and I'm running that through a uh, mobile mag mount slapped to the back of a cookie sheet in, in my apartment. But so far, it's working. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the feedback on my signal, and uh, I, I do appreciate that. I, I don't know if I'll try to check in again tonight. I might try it one more time, um, but we'll see how it goes. But uh, I do appreciate the feedback. This is KI-5 PWN. Well, KI-5 DWN, I have been a ham for almost exactly a year. Actually, I think as of today, it's a year. So welcome to the KI family. We're the KI cousins, and um, I hear you well enough. You could check into the net tonight, so don't move, don't change anything, including your sitting position, and uh, join us for Skynet or the Afterglow Net, where we talk about movies until the wee hours of the morn. This is uh, AG5 PM calling. I think it was KI5 T or D or B W N. Uh, I think I heard AG AG5 PN uh, calling for KI5 P W N. Yes, that. I just had a comment regarding your upgrading of the radio um, break. Uh, if I were you, I would upgrade your antenna first. You can use a 5 watt HT with a quality antenna and, and easily hit the repeater from um, 18 miles away. I'm 25 miles away from that repeater, maybe 30, and I'm running five watts right now. I don't know how I sound to you, but generally speaking, I, I, I get decent signal reports uh, from those uh, that have a, uh, an antenna that can hit the repeater properly. So that would be my first recommendation. You can always get an adapter to connect to the coax, go into that antenna, and then upgrade your radio later. But if you don't have a decent antenna, uh, it does, your radio is not going to help so much as you might think. HE5PM. Yeah, I5GCM. I actually have the opposite experience. I was running a 5 watt HT through the antenna. I upgraded the radio and it made all the difference in the world. Yeah. Different, different situations, I guess. Unfortunately, I think I just did upgrade my antenna. So uh, I have a Larson. I think the model number is two slash seventy B, I believe. But it's a uh, it's a uh, NMO mount antenna. It, it actually is a car mounted antenna. But I do have it mounted to a ground plane, and again, it's elevated. It's up pretty high on my second floor, so it's about probably uh, 18 to 20 feet up in the air. And uh, so I don't know what... Well, teach his own. Uh, take my advice for what it's worth. Putting, putting uh, an NMO mount antenna on a pie plate in your attic or wherever could work, but I'm talking about a decent dual band, um, half wave antenna mounted, you know, 20 feet would be good, and 5 watts would be sufficient, uh, depending on, you know, whether the antenna's in the clear or not. Uh, perhaps a radio upgrade would be in order as well, I mean, if you have, depending on the quality of the radio, but uh, my, my only point is that you don't need a lot of power uh, if you have <clears throat> a quality antenna in the clear with decent coax and connection to it. And the, um, anyway, this is AG5 PM. I'm going back to sleep. Good night. Antenna. 
antenna. That's not a uh, mobile designed antenna. In And I just doubled with you. He just answered the difference between his situation and mine. He has clear line of sight. I do not. So since I don't have clear line of sight, I need more power to drive that frequency, that, that signal through. Very good. I appreciate uh, input from everybody, and uh, I definitely will check into that. I'm getting an uh, indication that my battery is about to... I'm about to sign off. This is... WGA testing. This is KF5JHA. I wasn't sure uh, who that was that needed a test. You sounded pretty well. Chairman, I need to make myself very clear. If we uplink now, Skynet will be in control of your military. But you'll be in control of Skynet, right? That is correct, sir. Skynet.
will need to use the repeater before we begin the 9 p.m. Skynet. My name is Billy, and I'll be your net control for this session of the DARC Skynet. Skynet is a weekly net called every Saturday night at 9 p.m. concerning the subject of astronomy. Our purpose is to help amateurs become more familiar with the nighttime and daytime sky, astronomy, and space in general. This net is open to all amateurs interested in this topic. We encourage your participation, comments, and suggestions for this net. Stations with priority or emergency traffic may enter the net at any time by using the pro sign break break and your call sign. Is there any emergency or priority traffic? This is a directed net. Please do not transmit without direction from net control. That would be me. And stations are reminded to ID at the end of your transmissions. This weekly net operates on 146.880 MHz with a PL tone of 110.9. Check-ins via Echolink are also possible using the W5-R station ID or Echolink node 37247. Tonight's topics, astronomy charts, pictures, and live audio video links are available online. www.w5fc.org right now for the complete list. And remember to tell others about this popular net. All amateur operators are welcome. <clears throat> you need not be a member of any amateur radio club to participate. This net is 90 minutes long and is structured in several parts. General announcements, Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas events, where and when you can look through a telescope, National Space Society events, discussion topic of the evening, was up, space exploration and space history, Constellation of the Week, Space Launches of the Week, Recent Astronomical Discoveries, Visible Sacrifices over the next couple of days, Astronomical Q&A, and our 73 round. All amateurs licensed to transmit on this frequency are invited to check in, so at this time I'll turn the net over to my alternate net control, Tom, KE5ICX, if you will do the check-in honors, please. Billy, and thanks for doing the net this evening. This is uh, Kilo Echo 5 India Charlie X ray, KE5 ICX. I'll be your alternate net control taking check ins. So we will begin with low power short time check ins. If you're one of those, please come with your call sign, your name, where you're transmitting from. Let me know if you're low power short time. Please come now. Golf, Uniform Sierra, it's Gus, far, far northeast Dallas, low power. Kilo Echo 5, Romeo Lima, Romeo, Mike, South Plano, 10 watts. November Tango 5, Tango Mike, Tony in East Dallas. All right, let me get those low power short time. The first station, you were real weak. I think it was Tango Delta X-ray. Please come again with your call sign twice. I'm going to turn you up a little bit. You were a little light on audio. Let's try one more time. The, the station ending in X-ray. Bobby and Will Point, Whiskey, Delta 5, Mecca, Papa, X-Ray, WD5, DCX, Bobby, Will Point. Okay, I think it's uh, Whiskey, Delta 5, uh, Bravo, Papa, X-Ray, that's uh, Bobby and Will's Point, I believe. Did I get that? It was close. 
got it this time. Thank you. I'll be listening, but like to say, from here, it's a weak signal. 75 BPX, be listening. All right, Bobby, we got you checked in. W5GUS, that's Gus, far, far northeast Dallas, low power. KE5RLR, that's Mike in South Plano, low power. And then I've got Tony, NT5TM, over in East Dallas. I think he's probably low power, but I think he just checked in early. He could be short time. Uh, anyone else, low power, short time, please come down. Kilo 5, Sierra Lima Oscar, short time. Neil, Lake Highlands. Okay, we picked up K5SLO, that's Neil in Lake Highlands, and he is short time. Do any of the stations now checked in want to bring any announcements or bulletins to the net? Now is your opportunity before you disappear into the ether. Anyone checked in, please come with your call again. General check-ins. Here we go, kids. Uh, please come with your call sign phonetically, your name, where you're transmitting from. November 5, Bravo, Bravo. Bill and Urban. Whiskey Bravo 5, Oscar Zulu Lima, Brendan DeSoto. Kilo Golf 5, Juliet Papa, November, Mark and Oak Cliff. Kilo 5, Kilo, Tango X-Ray, Kelly in Quinlan. This is Alpha Golf 5, Papa Mike, Rich in Rockwall, AG5 PM. All right, I'll take those five. I've got N5BB, Bill and Irving, WB5OZL, Miss Brenda, DeSoto, KG5JPN, Mark and Oak Cliff, welcome back. K5KTX, Miss Kelly and Quinlan, AG5PM, Rich and Rockwall. Additional check-ins, please come now. I am not N5BB. I am KF5JHA, Chaz, on planet Earth. Kilo 5, Golf Lima Delta, Randy Rowlett. Kilo India 5, November Oscar November, Logan and Garland, I'll be listening. Kilo Foxtrot 5, Zulu, Bravo Lima, Bill Farmer's Branch. Kilo 1, Golf Bravo Delta, Guy in Lake Highlands. Hmm, everybody's so early. Groups of five this evening. I've got K5JHA, Chaz. Planet Earth, but that's only his summer residence. Uh, K5GLD, Randy and Rowlett, and KI5NON, Logan, Garland, K5ZBL, Mr. Bill, Farmer's Branch, K1GBD, Guy in Lake Highlands. Additional check-ins, please come now.
get additional check-ins a little later, let me go over to Echo Link. If you're on Echo Link uh, and you'd like to check in there, please come with your call sign, your name, where you're transmitting from. I will give you extra time. Please come now. Echo Link only. Control Whiskey Zero, Mike Bravo, Charlie, Shane. And that's the name of Hi, Dallas. All right, we've got W0MBC, that's Shane and Bethany, or is that Bethany and Shane in Blue Springs? We've got you both, KG5BZWJ near Weatherford. Uh, there's a few others on Echo Link. If you'd like to check in there, you can. I'll give you a second round, second chance. Uh, Echo Link only. Try again. All right, one more round. Uh, anywhere, any place, any mode, please come now with your call sign name, where you're transmitting from. This is Kilo Golf 5 Alpha Papa Lima, Patrick and Dallas. November 5, Golf Hotel Oscar, Lance in Louisville. Kilo Echo 5, Papa Oscar Echo, Lee in Mansfield. We picked up three more. I got KG5 APL, that's Patrick and Dallas. N5GHO, that's Lance and Louisville, one of my neighbors. KE5POE, that's Lee in Mansfield. Anyone else? And then we'll uh, get this net started. Anyone else like to check in? Please come with your call sign name, where you're transmitting from. This is Whiskey Bravo 5. Whiskey Golf Alpha, Greg in Irving. Up two more, but I'm going to need some fills. I got WB5WGA, Greg and Irving, and then the next station I got in November in the call, the second uh, second check in there. Would you please give me your call sign twice? I'm going to turn you up to 11 so I can hear you, and then your name and location. Oh, your audio is way down. I think I got a Whiskey Bravo 5 November. Did anyone else pick it up? Uh, can you give me a fill? All right, I'll tell you what. I'll come back to you a little later. Your audio is very, very low. I'm really having a hard time hearing it. I think it's a Whiskey... Bravo 5 November call. If you want to try one more time, I'll, I'll do it, but I, I don't think I'm going to be able to pull you out, but try, try one more time. I got the 
same thing, Whiskey Bravo 5 November, and then I couldn't pick up the last two. Okay, I'll come back to you. I'm going to put an asterisk by your name, and we'll try one more time a little later. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to give it back to Net Control. We've got 24 people checked in so far. So, um, uh, that KF5PDS from KE5ICX, back to you. Thanks a lot, Tom, and welcome to all who have checked in to Skynet. All right, let's go ahead and get started with general announcements. Do we have any general announcements for this evening's net? These can be ham, astronomical, space, or of general interest to licensed hams. If you have an announcement, please come now with your call sign. Number Tango 5, Tango Mike. Kilo Golf 5, Alpha Papa Lima. First we have NT5TM. Tony, good evening. What announcements do you have for us this evening? Give me one second, I have to switch uh, radios here. Okay, hopefully that will be better and I can use an entire watt. Uh, we do have a great net coming up tonight on Skynet and another fun net coming up at 10.30, the Afterglow movie discussion, which I believe tonight is featuring the big Tom Cruise hit, Minority Report. We also have an interesting couple of Mondays coming up. GeekNet, where we talk about anything we want to geek out about. It doesn't have to be ham radio related. Butterfly collecting and uh, stamps and anything you could think of. Cryptography. Uh, they're all welcome topics Monday at 7 p.m. But there's a hitch. I can't be there. I need a guest net control. If you'd like to try your hand at being a guest geek, please email nt5tm at w5fc.org. That's November Tango 5 Tango Mike at w5fc.org, and I will supply you with a good collection of starting material, and uh, you'll have a good time, and all the geeks on the net will help you out. No one will let you uh, have a bad net. But of course, we also have a big mystery coming up, too. What is that mystery? Well, it's the May 31st Monday night net, surprise net, a fifth Monday. I don't know what it's going to be about. It's a surprise. No one has sent me any ideas yet. NT5TM at W5FC.org. Maybe I can come up with a backup plan. Maybe Tom and I will put our heads together and come up with something cool. But maybe we won't. It could be up to you, and it probably will be. Send your surprise net ideas to NT5TM at W5FC.org, and we'll see what we can do for this fifth Monday surprise net to make it a fun night. So. I'm looking for a volunteer geek this Monday at 7, and I'm looking for surprise new ideas for the night of the 31st, NT5TM. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tony, and yeah, looking forward to that fifth Monday surprise net. All right, I believe I also heard with the key logo 5, Alpha Papa Lima, and with your announcement. Hi, all. This is KG5APL. Yeah, so I just had, I guess these are some things I would hope would be interesting to the folks here. Um, they're with some recent, I guess, talk about space station sightings. I wanted to share an app that I use. I brought this up during the AMSAT net a few days ago, um, but I wanted to share it here as well. Um, it's ISS Detector. That's India Sierra Sierra Detector. It's a great app that I use, and it gives you you know, anywhere from five minutes to 30 minutes to whatever you want heads up saying, hey, the space station's about to fly over, and here's where it's going to be. So it points you in the right direction. Um, it's a great app. I use it. And then that's the free version. If you throw them a couple bucks, they'll also um, give you functionality to be alerted for when the amps are flying over. So you can specify when they are going to be. And that'll do the same thing, let you know when they're going to go. Um, at the same time, though, 
um, Tom uh, N5HYP brought up an app that he uses, which was GoSat Watch. Now, I can't vouch for that one. I've only been using it for a couple of days, but so far it seems great. And if um, Mr. Tom recommends it, then I guess it's got to be good as well. Um, so those two apps were ISS Detector and Go Sat Watch. Thank you much. Back to you, KG5 APL. Thanks very much for those app suggestions. I hadn't heard of those. Uh, does anybody else have any announcements for this evening's note? If so, please come now with your call sign. Hearing any, so I'll go ahead with a couple of announcements of my own. The AMSAD Radio Amateur Satellite Group has two nets available to Dallas residents on Tuesday evenings at 8 p.m. Central Time. You'll need Echolink installed and you registered. You can find the net under Groups and AMSAT. Also, a live audio link is available on their website at www.amsatnet.com. This net originates in Houston, Texas. Dallas AMSAT Net East, Dallas Fort Worth, Texas, is every Tuesday at 8 p.m. on this repeater. 146.880 MHz with a PL tone of 110.9. Uh, on Tuesdays, Tom N5HYP is the net control. All are welcome to check in. First Tuesday of the month is DARC Club Night, so there's no AMSET East on that night. Dallas AMSET Net West is every Wednesday at 9 p.m. on the Arlington repeater, 140.140 MHz with a PL tone of 110.9 and a positive offset. The DARC hosts several nets on Monday nights. The first Monday of the month is Ham Fixin's net. On this uh, net, you'll find lots of good recipes. Uh, if you have a question about food or an anecdote or a recipe to share, join us for Ham Fixin's net. The second Monday of the month is MCOM 101 Emergency Communications. Come back for a second helping of Ham Fixin's Net on the third Monday of the month. And as Tony mentioned, fourth Monday is Geek Net. And also fifth Monday is Surprise Net. If we told you what it is, it would be a surprise. On-air participation is encouraged. Tuesdays, AMSAT East at 8 p.m., question and answer, info, and news for amateur uh, satellites. On Fridays is Cert City Simulation at 3 p.m., Learn about emergency radio communications via CERT-trained amateur radio operators. Melissa KI5GRH is usually net control. Visit the most disaster-prone city in the universe every Friday at CERT City. All are welcome. And Saturdays is the night of nets with TechNet from 7 to 8 p.m. And, of course, at 9 p.m., SkyNet. The first and third Sundays is the Dallas Amateur Radio Club meeting on the air. And daily, we have the Lunch Bunch at 12 noon, Monday through Friday. There's always a survey question. Eat lunch with us. And the ARRL Net National Traffic System Training Net is every night at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. All are welcome to check in on any or all of these nets. And, of course, as was mentioned earlier, at 10.30 p.m. following SkyNet is the Afterglow Movie Net. On this net, we choose a movie, we watch it during the week, and we come back on the following Saturday night and discuss the movie. We discuss uh, plot, characterization, special effects, music, uh, or any other interesting information regarding the movie. So that follows Skynet at 2 p.m. And so at this time, I'm going to turn the net over to Tom, KE5ICX, if you'll give us tonight's Afterglow info. So to ke 5 KF5 Thank you again, Ms. Billy. This is KE5 ICX. Listen up, everybody. The precogs were laying their precog eggs at an accelerated rate. One every 30 seconds. The activity looked like a Powerball pick payoff. It appeared they were reporting on pre-crimes on everything from smoking in airplane restrooms to jaywalking. Three cops showed up at the pre try and say this pre-crime Captain John 
Anderton's apartment. Captain, come out with your hands up, stated one of the futuristic officers. Anderton shouted, what are the charges? Sir, you're charged with future jaywalking next Friday, under tipping at a restaurant on Tuesday, and buying an avocado green refrigerator on Wednesday. These are serious crimes, sir. Somehow it seemed the precogs could have arrived 10 minutes earlier and arrested him before he woke up. But the pre-crime division was run by uh, Anderton, so it was no surprise that he'd first be arrested on this soon-to-be crime spree. Join us for another Philip K. Dick story. What is it, number three or four we've done? This one, Minority Report. Actually, it's a pretty good movie from 2002. It's a Steven Spielberg production at 1030 this evening. So uh, come on by. Even if you haven't seen it, we may entice you to see it. It's actually a pretty darn good film. Back to Net Control, KE5I6. And you can keep up with all the DARC events, nets, and activities by going to the club website, w5fc.org. All right, next up is Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas events, where and when you can look through a telescope. So at this time, uh, see if anyone on frequency can give us information about the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas. If so, please come now with your call sign. KF5JHA. KF5JHA, good evening. What information can you share with us tonight about the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas? Thank you, Billy. Uh, the next Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas Club meeting will be this coming Friday, on Friday, May the 28th at 7.30 p.m. It will be a virtual meeting on Zoom. The featured speaker actually is a committee. It's the Dark Side Committee. We actually have an observing site where you can go away from the city lights and look at things. So that's what the topic is going to be, and that's who's going to be talking about it. Uh, members of uh, the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas will receive an email link to the Zoom meeting uh, uh, sometime in the next uh, few days. Hopefully later this year, TAS will resume having face-to-face -face meetings and hopefully will resume having public observing sessions. To get more detailed information about all this, go to their website, texasastro.org. And that's it for me. Uh, this is KF5JJ, back to our net control, Billy. AF5 PDS. Thank you very much, Chaz. It sounds like it's going to be a great meeting. All right, next up is National Space Society events and activities. So at this time, I'll turn the net over to N5BB. Tell us uh, what you can information you have about the National Space Society. Thanks, Billy. Uh, this is N5BB. I am the membership director of the North Texas chapter of the National Space Society. If you have any questions about the National Space Society and want to learn how to join um, the society or our chapter, you can send me an email at space at byram.net. That's S-P-A-C-E at B-Y-R-O-M dot N-E-T. Uh, our normal meetings are the second Sunday of every month at 4 p.m. We would be meeting at um, a restaurant, but because of COVID, we're still doing virtual meetings. Um, our last meeting was on uh, May the 9th, Sunday, and it was kind of an overview about uh, currently planned uh, space uh, missions here in the next few years. I do not know the topic of the next meeting. Uh, I might have been told, but I've forgotten. <laughs> but it will be on Sunday, uh, June the 13th at 4 p.m. There are a lot of things going on with uh, 
both unmanned and human spaceflight right now. Um, there is a, uh, a company in uh, the northwest area of Austin uh, who builds rockets. And uh, there's another company east of Dallas, about an hour, out uh, near Greenville. That's Exocerospace. And uh, there's, of course, SpaceX doing things down in far south Texas. Uh, not to count, of course, NASA in Houston. So space is a very active uh, thing for the state of Texas. And with the Mars projects, and uh, the current planned uh, manned missions to the moon. It's going to be pretty exciting in the next few years. That's all I got, Billy. This is in 5BB. Thank you very much, Bill. And the North, uh, National Space Society of North Texas has a website, nssofnt.org. The National Space Society of North Texas has an active Facebook page. Just type National Space Society of North Texas into the search box and request access. You'll receive meeting reminders and club activities. This is KF5PS, PDS. Billy, your net control for this session ARC Skynet. Our right, this time is discussion topic of the evening. And so I found this article from 2017, Great Wagers in Physics History. This article comes to us from InsideTheParimeter.ca, the Perimeter Institute. Uh, and again, this article is from January of 2017. Two of the most powerful words in science might just be wanna bet. Science usually makes progress through rigorous research, testing, and verification. Sometimes a hunch and a little friendly competition can push science scientists to keep digging for the truth. The time-honored tradition of scientific wagers adds stakes, usually very, very low stakes, and levity to the scientific process. A bet led Isaac Newton to write what would evolve into his masterwork, Principia. Stephen Hawking might be the world's most famous present-day scientist, but that doesn't mean he knows all the answers. Despite numerous wagers, he has a terrible win-loss record, said Hawking's colleague, John Preskill, who has won some of these bets. Although Stephen Hawking is without a doubt a great scientist, he's a bad gambler. To Hawking's credit, maybe he, many believe he deliberately makes long odds wagers in order to bring attention to interesting scientific debates. Here are some of the greatest wagers, some settled, some still outstanding, in physics history. Earth theorist John Hampton, Hampton accepted a wager in 1870 with Alfred Russell Wallace, who bet 500 pounds he could prove the Earth was round. Wallace placed two markers five kilometers apart in Norfolk's Old Bedford River and showed with a telescope that the nearer marker appeared higher. Hampton was a sore loser and made increasingly nasty threats to Wallace afterward. On this webpage, you can, there's a link to the Bedford Level Experiment that you can uh, go to to read more about that. Stephen Hawking's bet record is quite abysmal. In 2012, when the Higgs boson was discovered at the Large Hadron Collider, he lost $100 to Gordon Kane of the University of Michigan. Hawking bet against the monumental discovery. And on this website, you can watch the mini documentary, Hawking at the Perimeter. Perimeter Institute Director Neil Turok has a winning bet with Stephen Hawking for $200 Canadian about the detection of primordial gravitational waves in the cosmic microwave background. If the waves are detected above the 5% level, Hawking wins. If the limit falls below the 5% level, Turok wins. And I don't know, uh, maybe someone out there knows if this one has been settled or not, because I know there's been up about gravitational waves in the news. Um, so I'll we'll ask about that after my presentation. You can also read more about the search for primordial gravitational waves from a link on this website. 
1997, Stephen Hawking and Kip Thorne teamed up in a bet against Caltech quantum physicist John Preskill regarding the so-called black hole information paradox. Hawking and Thorne said information was lost in a black hole, and Preskill disagreed. He seated in 2004, paying the stakes, a baseball encyclopedia. Thorne did not chip in because he felt the question had not yet been settled. And on this website, you can watch a short video that explains the black hole information paradox. August 2016, 44 physicists gathered in Copenhagen to settle a wager made 16 years earlier. 20 had bet that by then, the Large Hadron Collider would have detected evidence of supersymmetry. 24 bet against it. The no camp won, earning them a bottle of good cognac at a price no less than $100. And you can watch a short introduction to supersymmetry by Perimeter Distinguished Visiting Research Chair S. James Gate, Jr. Christopher Wren announced in 1684 that he would award a book worth 40 shillings to anyone who could, in two months, provide a mathematical theory linking Kepler's laws with a specific force law. Isaac Newton rose to the challenge with a paper that would become part of his magnum opus Principia, but was several years too late to claim the prize. And you can watch a talk by physicist Barry Barish that explores the hidden dispute behind Newton's Principia. Nobel Prize winner William Phillips has a $100 bet riding on whether major new surprises will pop up in quantum physics in the next half century. He wants it, but would love to be wrong. And you can watch an excerpt of William Phillips' public lecture at the Perimeter Institute. A bottle of whiskey was the prize in a bet in the 1950s between Walter Bada and Rudolf Minkowski over whether an odd-looking galaxy was actually two colliding galaxies. Minkowski conceded the loss, then reportedly drank most of the whiskey himself anyway. And you can read the story of Cygnus A and why many researchers now believe Minkowski was actually justified in drinking the whiskey. Preskill and Kip Thorne teamed up against, uh, on a bet against Stephen Hawking in 1991 regarding whether naked singularities could exist and be observed outside of black holes. Six years later, Hawking reluctantly conceded on a technicality that naked singularities could happen in generic conditions. And you can read a 1997 New York Times article about this wager. Only 20 years ago, astrophysicist Frank Hsu that colleague George Drogovsky that by 2001, several key parameters of the universe would be determined to within 20%. They originally stipulated 100 gallons of gasoline as the prize, but agreed that wine could be substituted if the world ran out of gasoline by 2001. And you can read Putting Their Money Where Their Minds Are in a New York Times article about scientific wagers. So again, this article can be found on the website insidetheperimeter.ca Wagers in Physics History. This is Kilo Foxtrot 5, Papa Delta Sierra. Your net control for this session of the BARC Skynet.
Whiskey Bravo number four, Mike Foxtrot India, Ted Dallas Low Power. Golf five, Zulu Mike Golf, Joe in Arlington. Picked up two more. I've got WB4MFI, that's Ted and Dallas, low power. KG5ZMG, that's Joe in Arlington. Anyone else? All right. Um, let's see. Now it's time for Do I Dare Say It, Chaz. K5JHA with What's Up. Chaz, the net is yours but bring it back with a full tank of gas. Oh, Dad, do I have to fill up the tank? Oh, yeah, this is Chaz, KF5JHA. My degree's in astrophysics. I am the astrophysics lab manager at Dallas College on the Brookhaven campus, and we do call this segment of Skynet, What's Up? Uh, slide number two, please, slide master. Thank you, Tom. Uh, on May the 19th, the moon was at its first quarter uh, phase. That was just a few days ago. So the current phase of the moon is a waxing gibbous. On May the 25th, that's only a couple of days from now, the moon will be at perigee, which is a point in the moon's orbit that is close to the Earth. On May 26th, the moon will be full and there will be a lunar eclipse. Uh, more on the lunar eclipse in a minute. On June the 2nd, the moon will be at its third quarter phase. And on May 25th, the moon will... Oh, I already said that. Yeah, I already said that. Okay. Oops, I've skipped through here. On May the 7th, the moon will be at apogee, which is the point in the moon's orbit that is furthest from the Earth. On June the 10th, the moon will be new. Slide number three, please. Early in the morning of May 26th, there will be a total lunar eclipse, which is the first part will be visible to us here in North Texas. We won't be able to see the last part. A lunar eclipse occurs when the moon moves into the shadow of the Earth. Most of the time, the moon just moves above or below the Earth's shadow as it orbits. But a couple of times a year, the moon travels into the Earth's shadow. There's a lighter part of the Earth's shadow called the penumbra and a darker part of the shadow called the umbra. When the moon moves completely into the umbra shadow of the Earth, we have a total lunar eclipse. The eclipse on May 26, 2021, is a total lunar eclipse. The last total lunar eclipse visible in Dallas was on January 21, 2019. The next total lunar eclipse visible from Dallas will be on May the 15th and 16th in the year 2022. Although there is a partial lunar eclipse this year, uh, November the 19th, 2021, that's very nearly a total lunar eclipse. 93% of the moon will go into the shadow, so that's going to be close to a total lunar eclipse. Slide number four, please, sir. At 3.48 a.m. Central Daylight Time, the moon will begin to enter into the penumbra shadow of the Earth. This is a difficult thing to notice. At 4.45 a.m. Central Daylight Time, the moon enters the umbra, and you should be able to notice the eclipse at that time. At 6.11 a.m., the moon is completely inside the umbral shadow, and we call that totality, the beginning of totality. The middle of the eclipse is at 6.19 a.m. Central Daylight Time. But hang on, at 6.22, the moon sets and the sun rises. We will not be able to see the remainder of the eclipse. Now, the beginning of astronomical twilight is around 4.43 a.m. Central Daylight Time. So after 4.43 a.m., the sky will become lighter and brighter and brighter. And Well, that means that totality at 6.11 a.m. may be very difficult to see in the very bright morning twilight. The moon 
just may disappear as we get close to totality. Could be an interesting clip to watch. I hope the weather is clear. It's early in the morning on May the 26th. Slide number five, please, sir. On May 28th, the planets Mercury and Venus will be in conjunction in the western evening sky. Uh, look uh, as it's starting to get dark, as twilight is setting in. Uh, slide number six, on May the 31st, the early morning sky, the moon will be in conjunction with Jupiter and Saturn. It's going to be in between the two planets, so it'll be an interesting thing to see. On uh, slide number seven, please. During the daytime of June the 7th and 8th, there will be a daytime meteor shower called the uh, Arids. Uh, Arids. Uh, now you can observe, a, how can you observe a daytime meteor shower? By re using radio, by listening to particular frequencies and listening for a reflected radio signal from a distant station, this could indicate an ion trail that's produced by a meteor. Details on how to observe a daytime meteors can be found at the American Meteor Society, amsmeteors.org, or the International Meteor Organization at imo.net. You could be able to observe up to 30 meteors per hour in the daytime. Interesting. Slide number eight, please. On June the 11th, there will be a conjunction of the moon and Venus in the evening sky. Start looking for both around 9 p.m. in the western sky. Slide number nine. Just two days later, on the evening of June the 13th, the moon will have moved close to Mars for his conjunction, uh, for this conjunction in the western sky. Uh, I have a cat that's trying to lay on the keyboard of the computer. That's what's kind of funny right now. Slide number 10. This is almost a catastrophe because it's a cat trying to lay on a computer keyboard. On the night of June the... Excuse me. It was a catastrophe. He moved the mouse. It's funny. A cat moved the mouse. On the night of June the 16th and 17th, a very sparse meteor shower, the June Lyrids, will peak with a few meteors per hour. Remember that usually the best time to observe meteors is between midnight and dawn. The very best time is the hour just before dawn. Slide number 11, on the night of June the 26th and 27th, could produce uh, from about a dozen meteors to more than 100 meteors per hour. Uh, that's another meteor shower, but a large number of visible meteors are not expected with the full moon being on June the 24th, which interferes with the observations. And this is KF5JJ, and this is Skynet. Slide number 12, please. Uh, once again, the next Texas Astronomical Society Club meeting will be on Friday, May the 28th, 7.30 p.m. And uh, the featured uh, topic will be about our dark site, our observing site. And that will happen via a Zoom virtual meeting. Details about this will be at texasastro.org. Now, slide number 13. Do any of you out there in Radio Land have a question or need to fill on any of the information or just have a general astronomy question. I don't know everything, but I love to hear questions, and I might know the answer to your question. So come now with your call sign if you have a question. Okay, Bob the Cat says it's okay with him without uh, having a... Uh, oh, yeah, Bob is. It's in the chat session. Somebody remembers Bob the Cat, yeah. Slide number 14, please. So as the moon wanes at the end of May, so do these words from this segment of Skynet. Stay safe, keep well, pray for our world. It's the only one where humans live. 
And until the next segment that I'm going to do in a few moments, keep looking up so you know what's up. And this is KF5JHA. Back to our net control, Billy, KF5PDS. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Tom.
but they have also found that the results they collected from perchlorate containing samples better match SAM data than when perchlorates were absent, bolstering the likelihood that organic salts are present on Mars. Additionally, Lewis and his team reported that organic salts could be detected by Curiosity's instrument, Kimmin. To determine the composition of a sample, Kimmin shoots X-rays at it and measures the angle at which the X-rays are diffracted toward the detector. Curiosity SAM and Kimmin teams will continue to search for signals of organic salts as the rover moves into a new region on Mount Sharp in Gale Crater. Soon, scientists will also have an opportunity to study better preserved soil below the Martian surface. The European Space Agency's forthcoming ExoMars rover, which is equipped to drill down to six and a half feet, will carry a Goddard instrument that will analyze the chemistry of these deeper Martian layers. NASA's Perseverance rover doesn't have an instrument that can detect organic salts, but the rover is collecting samples for future return to Earth where scientists can use sophisticated lab machines to look for organic compounds. Mars, I did want to mention that uh, there will be a sixth flight of the Ingenuity helicopter that's going to happen probably sometime this week. It will be a different flight in that the Perseverance rover will not be recording at this time because they're trying to get Perseverance ready to uh, start its own mission, and uh, it will be another different uh, <coughs> flight as well that the uh, the helicopter is going to uh, fly to a new location and try to use its own instruments to determine where to land. So be looking for that. And in space history this past week, starting with May the 16th back in 2011, Space Shuttle Endeavour launched on her last space flight, STS-134. The 16-day mission delivered the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer and other spare parts to the International Space Station. Coincidentally, 19 years earlier, Endeavour's first mission, STS-49, landed on the same day, May 16, 1992. Now retired, the orbiter is on display at the California Science Center in Los Angeles, which I've been to, and it's a pretty nice exhibit. On May 18, back in 1969, Apollo 10 launched. The crew's mission was to fly the complete profile of a moon landing mission without actually touching down on the moon. That goal was, of course, achieved on the next mission, Apollo 11. Apollo 10 was only the second human spacecraft to orbit the moon and the first to travel to the moon with a lunar module. While orbiting the moon on May 22, 1969, astronauts Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan descended into the lunar module, call sign Snoopy, to within nearly nine miles of the lunar surface. Meanwhile, astronaut John Young flew the command module, call sign Charlie Brown, awaiting the return of his crewmates. Having successfully tested the full lunar landing profile, the crew of Apollo 10 returned to Earth, splashing down on May 26, 1969. John returned to the moon as commander of Apollo 16, and Gene Cernan commanded Apollo 17. Unlike his crew, Tom Stafford never did get to walk on the moon. On May 20th, 1988, by executive order, President Ronald Reagan designated the National Space Technology Laboratories of NASA in the state of Mississippi as the John C. Stennis Space Center, or SSC. John Stennis served as a United States Senator for more than 40 years, in which time he supported the space program from its beginning and was an advocate for the leadership of the United States in space. The center itself played at the time of, his, of this designation and continues to play an important role in the nation's space program. Today, the SSC houses the rocket test complex used for testing all manned Apollo and shuttle flights and which continues to be used for testing next generation engines and rocket stages, including the, um, the new ones for the Artemis mission. In 1906, more than three years after they filed a request for their basic flying machine patent, Orville and Wilbur Wright were granted U.S. Patent 821393 for a new and useful improvement in flying machines. 
Prior to the patent request in 1903, the brothers built various craft and tools to research the workings of wings and aircraft control systems. These included kites and other unpowered aircraft, and even their own wind tunnels to test and compare the aerodynamic qualities of various wing models. On December 17, 1903, the Wright brothers got off the ground in four short flights at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, but they kept their achievement under wraps until they could protect the secrets of their control system with a patent. During the long wait for approval of the patent, the brothers continued developing motors and designs of their flying machines. By 1905, their third major design was able to fly for tens of miles at a time and with a degree of control that was unmatched. The level of sophistication of the Wright design would not be appreciated until 1908 when Wilbur Wright flew a series of demonstrations in France. And finally tonight, our astronaut birthdays that happened in the last week, and I think I mentioned this before, uh, it seems that if you are going to apply to be an astronaut, you better make sure that you were born in the month of May, because uh, there's quite a few. So starting with May the 16th, 1945, Brewster Shaw, who was a veteran of um, the Space Shuttle STS-9, 61B, and 28 shuttle flights. May 17, 1967, was Joseph Acaba. He is also a space shuttle veteran and a International Space Station veteran from uh, Space Shuttle Flights STS-119 and Expeditions 31-32 and Expeditions 53 and 54. May 18, 1930, was uh, the birth of Don Lind, who was part of shuttle flight STS-51B. May the 19th, 1939, Dick Scobie, who was on space shuttle flights STS-41C and the ill-fated challenge STS-51L. Also on May the 19th, 1955, was Pierre Thuot, who was space shuttle three times, 36, 49, and 62. We have three birthdays. First in 1944 is David Walker, uh, a veteran of several space shuttle flights, STS-51A, 30, 53, and 69. May the 20th, 1951, Thomas Akers, who was also space shuttle flights 41, 49, 61, and 79. And May the 20th, 1964, Paul Richards, one space shuttle flight, STS-102. And finally, May the 21st, 1942, was Robert Springer's birthday, and he was part of Space Shuttle Missions STS 29 and 38. And that's all I've got this evening. This is K5KPX. Back to you, Billy. Thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, this is KF5PDS. Billy, your net control for this DARC Skynet. All right, this time, uh, we'll go back over to Chaz for Miss Carolyn's Constellation of the Week. So, turning it over to KF5JHA from KF5PDS. The net is yours. Thank you, Billy. This is Chaz, KF5JHA, <laughs> with some assistance from Bob, the cat. Slide number 15, please. Miss Carolyn's Constellation of the Week is named in honor of Silent Key Carolyn, KC5OZT. Carolyn contributed to Skynet each week from almost its beginning in 2012 until May of 2019 with a detailed look at one particular constellation each week. Since there are about 52 easily visible constellations seen in Texas throughout the year out of the 88 total constellations, so Miss Carolyn covered the entire sky in a year. In her honor, we've continued the tradition of a constellation per week and named it in her honor. Miss Carolyn's constellation of the week this week is actually two constellations, Ursa Major, the Big Bear, and Ursa Minor, the Little Bear. The Big Dipper is easy to find right now because it's almost directly overhead. Well, maybe not tonight with all the cloud cover, but, you know, on a clear night sometime in the next week, look straight up in the evening sky. 
Uh, if you've been wondering why we've had so much rain, it's because the Big Dipper is upside down and all the water is falling on top of it. Wouldn't I make a great meteorologist? The Big Dipper is just a part of the Big Bear, and right now the bear is also upside down. Uh, which may, brings me to slide number 16, but this one's not on there. You do know what a bear takes if he has a headache, right? Uh, bear aspirin, right? Oh, okay, slide number 16, yes. Uh, these are what you've been waiting for all week long, the jokes of the week. So what do you call a bear with no ears? Well, you have to take E-A-R-S off of bears, all you have left is a B. So what do you call a bear with no ears? Uh, B. Okay, maybe that wasn't that funny. What color socks do bears wear? Uh, they don't wear socks. They have bear feet. Why didn't the teddy bear eat his lunch? Because he was stuffed. <laughs> I like that one. What kind of car do bears drive? Ferraris. Okay. Why do grizzly, grizzlies never look sad? Because when there's a problem, they just grin and bear it. And the final one for this part of the segment. What do you call a bear with no money? Bear-oak. Okay, bear-oak. Okay, well, uh, that didn't work too well, did it? Okay, slide number 17, please. The name Ursa Major is Latin for the Great Bear or the Big Bear. Ursa Major is better known by its famous asterism, which contains the Big Dipper. Alcorn Mizar, they are the middle star and the handle of the Dipper. They're a famous optical double. Um, we say that they are an optical double because we don't know if they're really orbiting around each other. It would make them a true binary system. Even if they're not a true binary system, they're associated with each other because they share the same proper motion as they're both members of the Ursa Major Stellar Association. I don't know, is that a club or a union? I don't know. The name Mizar is ambiguous in origins. It could possibly come from a corruption of the name uh, Mirak, which is the name of the Beta Ursa Major star, the bottom star at the end of the Dipper's Bowl. Uh, one of the two-pointer stars that are associated with Polaris. Uh, in fact, you go from Merrick to Doobie and you run into the North Star. We'll get to that later on. The name Alcor is a corruption of the Arabic phrase for the rider, which it, it appears to be riding on Mizar. The number of different cultures of the past referring to Mizar and Alcor as a horse and a rider. There's quite a few of them. Ancient Arabs also used Mizar and Alcor as a test of visual acuity. Acuity. Someone could see both stars, then they were considered to have good eyesight. Have you done it? Have you been able to see Mal uh, Miser and Alcor with just your two eyes without optical aid? I do on a regular basis. It just so happens that Miser and Alcor was featured in the binocular highlight in the June 2020 issue of Sky and Telescope magazine. This article states that Miser and Alcor is not simply stars, but two stellar systems. Alcor is actually a double star, and Mizar is at least a quadruple star system. The brightest companion to Mizar is easily visible in small telescopes. And in large tri uh, tripod mounted, uh, mounted binoculars, it has a 14 arc second separation from Mizar. Slide number 18, please. M81 is a beautiful spiral galaxy. It and its nearby companion, M82, can be seen in a pair of 50 millimeter binoculars. Uh, M81 and 82 appear as just the faint fuzzballs in handheld binoculars, but they are 
at least visible, making him both candidates for the binocular Messier Club. Now, you need to do this away from the city lights. M81 shows up much better in a telescope, as you would expect. It shows us a fuzzy oval shape with a bright center. This is uh, the galaxy's nucleus. The area of the spiral arms is dimmer than the nucleus, but in an 8 to 10 inch scope, you cannot quite make out actual spiral arms. But I have seen them recently, just a couple weeks ago, at the West Texas Star Party in my 16-inch telescope. That was pretty cool. M82 is an unusual galaxy that is near M81. The two galaxies are associated with each other and are, in fact, the brightest members of what is known as the M81 Galaxy Group, which is the second closest galaxy cluster to our own local group. Only the sculptor group is closer. M82 is the unusual galaxy that earned its place in Halton Arp's catalog of peculiar galaxies. It is usually enough that Arp lumped it in and uh, a small handful of other galaxies into a category called miscellaneous hmm, in his catalog. A class of galaxies he's dubbed as unique. Hmm. In a small telescope, it's easy to uh, differentiate between uh, M81 and 82 because of M82's edge-on appearance. This edge-on appearance has caused M82 to be nicknamed the Cigar Galaxy. Both M81 and 82 are known as Bode's Nebula because they were first discovered by Joanna Bode in 1774. Slide number 19, please. M97 is the Owl Nebula, a planetary nebula discovered by Michin in 1781 and added by Messier to his catalog that same year. It was given the name Owl Nebula by Lord Rossi in 1848 after viewing it through a 72-inch reflector. I, that's a big telescope. It is very small and dim in smaller scopes, but it's definitely noticeable in non-stellar nature unlike many planetary nebulas, which just looks like a star. M97 and also M108 are so close together that both are visible in the same low-powered field of view in some telescopes. Medium to large apertures are needed to see the owl's eyes. I thought I could see his eyes in the 16-inch a couple of weeks ago. There are other Messier objects in Ursa Major, which include M40, M109, M101, and M108. It is worth your time to look for these objects as well. And this is KF5JJ, and this is Skynet. Slide number 20, please. Ursa Minor is Latin for little bear. It also forms the well-known asterism of the Little Dipper. The four stars forming the bowl of the Little Dipper are interesting in that they are second, third, fourth, and fifth magnitudes providing a very easy guide to determining what magnitude of star is visible at any given time, at any given night. Polaris, Alpha Ursa Major Minoris, is part of uh, something called the engagement ring asterism. We'll talk about that in a moment, too. Polaris is known as the North Star or the Pole Star. It is not the brightest star in the sky. In fact, it's the 49th brightest star. In earlier times, it was called Stella Polaris, but the name fell out of common usage a long time ago. Polaris is one of the most famous stars in the sky because of its location near the North Celestial Pole. The star is not located precisely at the true North Celestial Pole, but however, it is less than one degree distant. During the next century, this distance will be diminishing and the star will be at its closest to the North Celestial Pole in the year 2102 A.D. At that time, uh, Polaris will only be 27.5 arc minutes from the pole. Polaris is a second magnitude yellow-white star of spectral type F7 and is 430 light years from the solar system. It's also an easy double star for small telescopes. Polaris is actually a triple star system and the Hubble Space Telescope successfully imaged the faint third member of the system recently. Polaris is part of the nice asterism called the Diamond Ring, or the Engagement Ring, which is easily visible in binoculars or a finder scope. 
yeah, you need not a telescope, but binoculars or a finder scope. And I've got a, if you're looking at the video view of the Skynet, you'll see an image of the engagement ring, and Polaris is the bright star of the ring. Kochab. Kochab is derived from the Arabic term Al-Kochab, um, which means the star of the north. It named, it derived from the fact that 3,000 years ago, Kochab was the closest star uh, to the true north celestial pole. It's the second magnitude orange star in spectral type K43. It's believed to be about 100 light years away. It appears a yellow-white in an 8-inch telescope. Slide number 21, please. NGC 6217 is a magnitude 11.2 galaxy located near the bowl of the Little Dipper. It is a barred spiral. Walter Scott Houston noted that it should be visible in any telescope eight inches or larger. Uh, but as Good Nights has been able to see it with his four inch telescope, he's famous for seeing faint things that nobody else can see. Being so close to the pole, it is visible throughout the year, and Houston notes that it provides a good test of sky transparency. I can't remember if I've ever looked for this. Uh, this is KF5, JHA, and this is Skynet. Slide number 22, please. There are more Astronomical League observing program objects than the constellation of Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, the big and little bear. I've given you just a sampling of some of those objects. Most of the rest of the objects are in Ursa Major. Uh, the Astronomical League has over 70, in fact, I think it's 72 or 73, different observing programs, most of which have around 100 objects. If you observe just 10 different objects in an observing program each month, then you can earn an observing certificate and you can earn a pen in about a year. Slide number 23, please. And that is Miss Carolyn's Constellation of the Week, Ursa Major, the Big Bear and Ursa Minor, the Little Bear. I want to thank my friends Dave Hutchinson and Dennis Harwell for their research and words on the deep sky objects that I've used, borrowed, and I usually steal for tonight and other nights as well. I also at time use the website constellation-guide.com for information. Next week we're going to take a look at two other constellations, Coma Bernices, Bernices Hair, and Canis Venatici, the hunting dogs. Isn't that funny? Chaz is going to talk about someone's hair. Uh, Billy, it's all yours. This is KF5, JHA, back to P KF5, PDS. Thank you very much, Taz. All right, this time uh, it, we're ready for space launches for the week. So over to Tom, KE5, ICX. Tom, if you'll do a quick check-in round and see if we've got anybody out there that would like to check in. And then if you can give us some information about space launches for the week, that would be great. So this is to KE5ICX from KF5PDS. And this is indeed KE5ICX. I'll take additional check-ins. Please come with your call sign name, where you're transmitting from. Kilo, Bravo, Nine, Zero, Oscar, Kilo, Sean and Fort Worth. All right, we picked up one more. I've got KB9SOK, Sean and Fort Worth. All right, it's going to be short and sweet this evening on launches. Uh, we have to be determined Long March 7, Qin Sao 2. Uh, long, Chinese Long March 7 will launch Qin Sao 2 resupply ship to dock with the Chinese space station, the one that was launched a few weeks ago. The automated cargo craft will be the first resupply freighter for the Chinese space station. On May 26, we have a Falcon 9 launch. This will be from... Um, Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral, Florida. The SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket will launch the 29th batch of approximately 60 satellites for SpaceX Starlink Broadband Network, a uh, mission designated Starlink V1.0 L28. On May 27th, we have a Soyuz launch. 
Uh, this will be at 1743 uh, Greenwich Mean Time. This is from the Vostokchi Cosmodrome in Russia. The Russian Soyuz rocket will launch 36 satellites into orbit for one web, which is developing constellation of hundreds of satellites in low Earth orbit for the low latency broadband communications net network. Everybody say it together. This will be a Soyuz 2.1B rocket, which will use a, you can never forget it, because it's the Fregat upper stage. May 27th, we have a one March 3B launch. Uh, we'll launch from the Fengen 4B geostationary weather satellite, the second in a new generation of Chinese meteorological observatories. Uh, that would, uh, oh, no dates. I did mention that. That's it. That's all I got. It's unusual. Usually there's more, but uh, that's it for me. Um, back to net control. This is KE5 ICX. Next up is recent astronomical discoveries, so I'll turn the net over to Brenda, WB5L. The net is yours. Thank you, Billy. This is WB5OZL. This article is entitled, Hubble Tracks Down Fast Radio Bursts to Galaxy's Spiral Arms. Astronomers using NASA's Hubble Space Telescope have traced locations of five brief radio bursts blast to the spiral arms of five distant galaxies called radio called fast radio bursts, FRBs. These extraordinary events generate as much energy in a thousandth of a second as the sun does in a year. Because these transient radio pulses disappear in much less than the blink of an eye, researchers have had a hard time tracking down where they come from much less determining what kind of object or objects is causing them. Therefore, most of the time, astronomers don't know exactly where to look. Locating where these blasts are coming from, and in particular what galaxies they originate from, is important in determining what kinds of astronomical events trigger such intense flashes of energy. The new Hubble survey of eight FRBs helps researchers narrow the list of possible FRB resources. The first FRB was discovered in archive, archived data recorded by the Parks Radio Observatory on July 24, 2001. Since then, astronomers have uncovered up to 1,000 FRBs, but they have only been able to associate roughly 15 of them to particular galaxies. Our results are new and exciting. This is the first high-resolution view of a population of FRBs in Hubble reveals that five of them are localized near or on a galaxy's spiral arms, said Alexandria Manning of the University of California, Santa Cruz, the study's lead author. Most of the galaxies are massive, relatively young, and still forming stars. The imaging allows us to get a better idea of the overall host galaxy properties, such as its mass and star formation rate as well as probe what's happening right at the FRB position because Hubble has such great resolution. In the Hubble study, astronomers not only pinned all of them to host galaxies, but they also identified the kinds of locations they originated from. Hubble observed one of the FRB locations in 2017 and the other seven in 2019 and 2020. <clears throat> we don't know what causes FRB, so it's really important to use context when we have it, said team member Wang Fai Fong of Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. This technique has worked very well for identifying the progenitors of other types of transients, such as supernovae and gamma ray bursts. Hubble played a big role in those studies, too. The galaxies in the Hubble study existed billions of years ago. Astronomers, therefore, are seeing the galaxies as they appeared when the universe was about half as complete. Many of them are as massive as our Milky Way. The observations remain in ultraviolet and near infrared light with Hubble's wide field camera three. Ultraviolet light traces the glow of young stars strung along a spiral galaxy's winding arms. The researchers use the near infrared images to calculate the galaxy's mass and find where older populations of stars reside. Oh, this is a long article. I'm going to cut it off there because it's 1025. Uh, if you want to go read the whole thing, this is from uh, sciencedaily.com. 
Back to net, WB five O Z L. Great, thank you, Brenda. All right, uh, up next is uh, visible satellite passages over the next couple of days. So uh, I'll just mention that you can use the website www.heavens-above.com website to find out what's in orbit and where to look during flyovers. Again, that's www.heavens-above.com. This time we'll see if we uh, do a little bit of astronomical Q&A. Does anybody have a question? Throw out, uh, see if they uh, could get an answer to. Uh, so please come. Hearing any, so I'll throw it again once uh, to Tom, KU5ICX, if you'll do a final check in round and uh, give me a final count for this evening's net, I'd appreciate it. So, KU5ICX from KF5PDS. And this is KE5ICX for one final round of check-ins. If you'd like to join us this evening, come on. You know you've been listening. Let us know you're out there. Uh, please come to your call sign, your name, where you're transmitting from. So quiet out there. Well, uh, can't get any more out of them. Uh, we've got 27 check-ins. This delay from KE5ICX. Great. Copy that. We had tw tonight. We had 27 hands participating on the air. So thank you to all who checked in this evening. We hope you'll join us here next week and every Saturday night at 9 p.m. to discuss astronomy, space, and space exploration. On this net, the sky is never the limit. We're always looking for net control stations for this and all the other BARC nets. If you would like to try your hand at this, contact any of the net controls by sending an email to nets at w5fc.org. You can follow topics and discussion about this net and astronomy in general on Facebook and Twitter, as well as our audio and video streams, video archives, and other useful Internet resources by going to w5fc.org at the conclusion of this net. So until next Saturday night, this is KF5PDS, Billy. I'll be closing the net at 2228 local time and returning the repeater to normal amateur use. 73, everybody, and enjoy the evening discovering the universe. And remember, following this net is the Afterglow Movie Net, where we will discuss Minority Report. 73, everybody. And this is KE5ICX. We'll be back in about five minutes. Everybody gets a little break. Go powder your noses and come back. As, as uh, Miss Billy said, we'll be talking about Minority Report. I also need a net control precog type person. Think about it. We'll start begging in a few minutes. So be back in five. This is KE5ICX. I'm completely operational, and all my circuits are functioning perfectly. Afterglow movie net.
Do we have anyone interested in being net control for tonight's iconic film, Minority Report? You know you want to. To actually be a net control for a good movie, come on, that doesn't happen all that often. Who would like to be net control? Who wants to be Spartacus? Who wants to be a free cock? Please come now. That's my name, but I didn't really want to volunteer in 5 PB. This, this, this pool ball just rolled in front of me and it said that you will be famous. Yeah, but what color is that ball? Unless you're colorblind, then it all looks the same. You know, there is no need for all that. It's kind of like a Rube Goldberg machine. It's nearly surprising the ball didn't knock over some dominoes. And then when everybody gives answers and you say, oh, wait a minute, that's correct. That's a better idea than I ever thought. You get to make your comments at the end. You get to say, well, you know, I thought of that all along. For years I've thought that that was an appropriate thought for that uh, a comment on that film. You're king of the world or something like that. But they <laughs> you end up on the bow of the Titanic, so I don't know what that means in the scheme of things. Okay. I, who is Spartacus? I am Spartacus. This is in 5 BB. And I am assuming, and you know what happens when you assume. I'm assuming net control for Skynet. That's right, that's the weekly net here after, excuse me, Afterglow. I got my antecedents wrong. Afterglow, which is the weekly net after Skynet, here on the 146.88 Dallas Amateur Radio Club repeater. Be here or be square. And we are going to talk about the movie Minority Report, which came out in 2002 it was supposed to be about 2054. Um, however, the trains don't look like 2054 trains to me. They like look like 2002 trains. And they still wear black suits and blazers. I tell you, the clothing was boring. Okay. Now, let's talk about after the Afterglow movie Minority Report with Tom Cruise. Carefully filmed so he didn't look short. But we all know the truth. Okay, first let's do check-ins. Um, so, let's start with RF check-ins because I haven't yet powered up my... My Echo Link iPad. So as I'm working on that, let's take RF check-ins 
for the ethical net, talking about minority report. RF only, please come now. This is N5BB. Your volunteer net control. Kilo Echo 5, India, Charlie, X ray, Tom, Louisville, I did see the movie. Tom, have we scared away everybody else? This is N5BB. I did see the movie. And I recognize KE5ICX, who did see the movie. Pray tell somebody out there, besides Tom and me, must have seen this movie at some time. It was a pretty famous movie. Who would like to uh, check in to the Afterglow Net? This is N5BB. This is W B five O Z L. Name is Brendan DeSoto. And yes, I saw the movie. Kilo Bravo Nine Sierra Oscar Kilo. Sean in Fort Worth. I did see the movie. Okay, I reckon that's Brenda, WB5OZ. Hi, Brenda. And Sean, KB9SOK. Who else would like to check into the Afterglow movie? Net. This is N5BB, Net Control. Wow, this is a shy group. Let's try Echolink. I see Billy, Jay, and Chris. Billy, would you like to check in to Afterglow? This is N5BB. Good. Kilo, Foxtrot 5, Papa Delta Sierra. Billy and Sherman, yes, I saw the film. Thank you, Billy. Recognize Kia 5 PDF. Jay, KG5 BZW. You want to check in, Jay? Yes, I'd like to check in. Kilo Golf 5, Bravo, Zulu, Whiskey, Jay, now effort, and I've seen the film. Very good, Jay. I recognize KG5 BZW on Echo Link. Uh, Chris, KF5GBT, do you want to check in? KF5GBT, Chris and Godly. I did see the movie, but I'm short time, so I won't be able to join the discussion. Very good, Chris. Next, I see somebody just popped in, W5JWK. Jim, somewhere in North Texas. Jim, where are you? And would you like to check into the Afterglow Net? We're talking about the 2002 movie Minority Report. You want to get involved with this? Uh, W5JWK and 5BB, over. Well, I just happened to check in and I heard the uh, net going. Um, don't have anything to say about the minority report. I, I think we are maybe the minority, but that's okay. Uh, we're up here in Bowie, 
Bowie, Texas, 50 miles southeast of Wichita Falls. Very good, Jim. Yeah, I know where Bowie is. Years ago, I say years ago, about 30 years ago, I was traveling up there to Wichita Falls uh, quite a bit on business. So I uh, know where Booby is. Very good. Well, thanks for joining us. Do we have anybody else on any mode that would like to check into the Afterglow Net tonight? We're talking about the 2002 movie Minority Report. Anybody else like to check in? This is N5BB, Net Control. Over. Tom, KE5ICX, would you like to give us a short synopsis of what this movie is about? Yeah, I can go ahead and do that. I, I can give you the, I just close the, the, the file on the one. Hold on a sec. Let me, uh, yeah, I can give you one uh, for Minority Report. And hang on just a second. I just closed the script for the uh, the funny one, but I'll, go, I'll give you a little synopsis on uh, the actual film. So, if the year is April 2054, the federal government is planning to incorporate Washington, D.C.'s prototype pre-crime police department, prevents murders through three clairvoyant humans called precogs attached to a computer that can pre-visualize them. Would-be murderers are then imprisoned in a benevolent virtual reality state, almost all premeditated. First degree murder has ceased as people have got the message. However, spontaneous crimes of passion are still problematic as the police have limited time to intercept the killer. While the United States Justice of Department of Justice agent Danny Witwer audits pre-crime, the pre-cops predict that 36 hours, Leo Crow will be murdered by the program's captain, John Anderton. Uh, Anderton flees the area as Wittar begins the manhunt. Dr. Iris Heinen, the creator of the pre-time technology, reveals secret information to him. Uh, someone, something, uh, sometimes one of the pre cogs cogs, usually Agatha, she's the female, there's two males and one female, has a different vision than the other two, a minority report of a possible alternative future. Anderton kidnaps Agatha, shutting down the group-minded precogs system. Anderton and Agatha find Crow in his hotel room at 36 hour time nears. And that's how long you've gotten to uh, <clears throat> where they see the crimes ahead of time. Finding numerous photos of children, including Anderton's disappeared son, son Sean, Anderton accuses him of being a serial child killer. Crow, however, reveals an unknown entity hired him to plant the photos. While Agatha and Anderton don't find a minority report for Crow, Agatha does show him a murder that occurred five years prior of Anne Lively, Agatha's mother. Okay, I'm going to stop there because if you haven't seen the film, this gives away the whole plot. So uh, essentially what it is is that uh, premeditated uh, murder is no longer. It's crimes of passion because these three pre that were never explained really how they became that way, but they were further nurtured later on. Uh, with a whole bunch of stuff going on along with uh, all of that. Uh, Steven Spielberg film, so it's got uh, high-tech um, um, FX uh, effects and all of that. Uh, there was a lot of uh, product placement in it as well, but we'll, we'll get into the discussion about it. Tom Cruise vehicle, this film has been considered uh, a sleeper in that it was very popular when it, it came out. However, it's well, it kind of just disappeared. It's not like Blade Runner, a Philip K. Dick story that has uh, survived and had a sequel to it, even though it never made any money and never uh, made any money uh, in the sequel. Uh, it, it is still uh, highly revered. This Philip K. Dick, Dick story, uh, with Steven Spielberg's uh, fingerprints all over it, hasn't fared as well, which is kind of a surprise. Uh, back to Net Control. This is KE5ICX.
Okay. By the way, I can hear some other repeater on 8.8. Uh, the, the, our, our repeater is overpowering it, but I still hear quite a bit of interference every time it transmits, which is kind of interesting. So if you're hearing something else on frequency, it's probably other repeater. That probably means that weather conditions are such that we're listening to a repeater probably several hundred miles away in Oklahoma, with who knows where. <laughs> anyway, okay, um, thank you, Tom. Um, I'm going to go through these in backwards order. So Jim and Bowie says he can't participate. Chris didn't want to because he was short time. So I'm going to count them out. So, Jay, let's start with you. We're talking about the plot of Minority Report. The plot. What did you think about the plot? Get you 5 bzw in the group and 5BB after Gwinnett. Um, first, uh, okay, cool. Uh, this is KG5 EZW. Um, and, well, I I like the film. Um, there's a major plot hole in it. I mean, it's just, I don't, it's almost, you just can't get around it, but it's one, of, it's, it's, um, well, Steven Spielberg, who generally doesn't do too badly. Um, it, it, it does have, that's, uh, let's be honest, uh, I think it's more about Tom Cruise having his, his uh, 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 fingerprints all over it that some people might have some uh, problems with, but um, uh, I, I, I actually don't mind that too much. I, I kind of know what <laughs> some, like, you always want to have a Tom Cruise running somewhere just, or whatever, and all that jazz, but whatever. Um, yeah, about the, the, the one, I think, okay, uh, I guess I better show with the, 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 the one negative. Um, it, it's part of the, 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 the plot, and I don't know how they can get, you can get around it. It's he, he brings, you know, spoiler alert, um, he brings uh, his eyes, his former eyes, to the lab so that he can get back in. Um, there's a difference between authorization and rights, um, and I have, kind of have a, I really have doubts that a, a system that, um, um, would handle security wouldn't have rights, couldn't easily revoke rights, unless there's some sort of weird, uh, something about this particular character that made his rights hard to be revoked, and I, I, that might be the, the, the little loophole that, that you can kind of send this uh, um, movie through, but um, otherwise, you know, it's an action flick, um, and it, the action scenes are, are well done. Um, I do have to wonder um, just how, how close it was to the original story. I have not read it. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, it works as an action flick, and um, I really can't complain uh, otherwise. Um, there's probably a few other things worth mentioning, but I can't really think of anything. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy with the film. And uh, I think I'll leave it with, at that. I'm going to probably regret not having anybody in front of me so I could comment on, you know, uh, have a comment all on their comment, but uh, that's all right. Thank you, Bob BZW. Back to that. Okay, thank you, Jay. For those tuning in, we're talking about Minority Report, the 2002 movie. Next, Billy, KFI PDS. Billy, what did you think about the plot? This is in 5BB. Um, yeah, overall, I like this. I've watched it several times. I do have to be kind of in the mood to watch it, so I don't watch it like every single time it comes on. But 
Um, it is a movie that I would watch over and over again. Um, I thought the plot moved well, although um, there are several differences between the movie and the book, which could be like its own round. You know, here we're talking about plot. We could have a round to discuss the differences between the film and the book, so I won't do that here. Um, I do think the choices were good. I guess they kind of Hollywooded it up, you know, to make it more of an action film uh, and to drive the action. Uh, I thought, uh, you know, the choices were okay, but, yeah, I don't like it when people mess too much with the, with the original, uh, especially when it's a classic author like Philip K. Dick, you know. Um, but I think they made some good choices because the original story, I've read it, but it's been several years, and it does have pretty dark kind of despairing tone to it so um i think the choices they made were good to make it more of an action film um i didn't think it lagged anywhere the places where it slows down are appropriate to give plot exposition and to drive the plot forward to clue the viewer into what's going on as to how the pre-crime system works what the different color you know red ball versus brown ball and things like that, you know, the action slows down enough to tell the story and then it picks back up again. So I thought it was a good mixture of action and and plot development and character development. Um, some plot hole things that I don't agree with. Um, one is very nitpicky, but it is a continuity detail that is easily followed up on is the date. They said Tuesday, April 22nd, 2054. If you go to a calendar, it's actually a Wednesday. I thought that was kind of a weak uh, thing. It's like somebody should have checked up on that. That's the continuity people dropping, dropping the ball <laughs> on that. Um, and the other thing that I have trouble with in the plot is Anderson did not know who it was. You know, it's a spoiler alert, spoiler alert. Um, turn down your radio now. Um, Leo, he did not know who Leo Crow was. How could he premeditate, you know, because Anderson came up a brown ball, which means a premeditated murder, and he didn't even know who Leo Crow was, so how could he premeditate to kill him? And he didn't decide to kill him until minutes before Crow showed up. So he technically should have been a ball. He should have been a crime of passion. Um, so that's one, one thing I didn't agree with in the story. And the other one was, why did he hide in the tub to get away from the spiders? The eyes, if they had scanned it, it would not have come up as him because he had a different pair of eyes. So, um, or unless he was just trying to hide to keep from being scanned because he said any exposure could cause blindness. That's the only thing way I can kind of justify that. Um, other than that, um, I think everything was very well done, good, a good action. Um, good mixture of action and carries through right to the end so I, overall I like the plot I enjoy the movie and it's one that I will keep watching over and over again whenever I'm in the mood to watch it I'll return it to you this is KFS back to next thank you Billy now let's talk about Let's we'll talk to KB9SOQ. Hello, Sean. What do you think about the plot of Minority Report? This is N5BB, after Glonet. Yeah, I, uh, this is KB9SOK. Um, I might be one of those people that's kind of uh, more in the middle on this one. Uh, I thought the movie was okay, but to be all honest, I really didn't think it was that great. I can kind of see why this doesn't have the following of some of the other movies that that writer had written, because uh, to me the movie was, seemed actually very predictable, you know, it seemed like very early on it was easy to predict that obviously, you know, the Tom Cruise character John was going to probably be, you know, uh, be one of the people that was being predicted, uh, so that, that was pretty easy to see coming, and maybe that's some that's from the commercials before the movie came out, but it just seemed very predictable, and, you know, I thought, you know, probably get more into the characterization later, but uh, it just seemed like everybody was pretty predictable in this movie, and even just not too far into it, I kind of figured out that the, uh, the the creator and the owner of that system was ultimately involved in it, and that uh, it just, I just didn't really find it that interesting, the story, actually. Uh, I'm guessing the book's probably quite a bit better, maybe from some of the comments already made, um, 
you know, I thought the whole ball thing was just kind of ridiculous because with that technology, I think you just have an indicator on a screen. I know they kind of tried to explain it, why they did that at the beginning. To me, that just seemed a little ridiculous. Yeah, visually it was cool to look at, but it really, technology-wise, didn't make any sense at all why you would do that. And yeah, and I agree, there's a little potholes throughout it, like the whole, yeah, his access should have been revoked the moment that he was obviously being chased. Um, kind of going into the special effects a little bit, just, you know, like the, the, where they were chasing him in the, the jetpack scene. That, that whole, I mean, you, those things didn't even remotely look like real jetpacks. And, and you could clearly see they were being hung by wires because they were hanging at 45 degree angles, which means that would have sh not shot them straight up. It would have pushed them up 45 degrees. So I, I don't know. There's just little things that kind of threw me off as I watched this that, you know, I was just surprised for a Spielberg film that, that it, uh, you know, to me it kind of underdelivered. So I can kind of see. I mean, it was okay. It's better than a lot of the stuff we've seen. But to be honest, I don't know that when this is on TV, I generally don't watch it. And I haven't seen it since it came out. And I watched it again this week just to review. Um, but I guess I should also say, too, that I don't think Tom Cruise is particularly that good of an actual actor. Uh, I mean, he's been very popular in some action films. But I, I just don't think he delivered in this as, as maybe it would be with somebody else. Um, but yeah, it was just okay for me. That's all I got. This KB9, it's okay. Back to that control. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Let's now go with Brenda, WB5OZL. Brenda, what did you think about the plot of Minority Report? This is N5BB at the Afterglow Net. This is WB5OZL. Um, I saw this the first time around and I didn't remember much about it. I probably fell asleep. But watching it again, I, I really liked the story and um, the action and all. Of course, um, Tom Cruise always plays Tom Cruise. But evidently people like that because he keeps playing Tom Cruise over and over and over again. <laughs> so that's okay. And I'm a big fan of Philip K. Dick, too. Yes, yeah, some plot holes. That happens. Um, one of the things I don't like about these kind of movies is um, the frenetic camera work, jumping back and forth and back and forth, and it's a little hard to keep up with. And the fight scene in the factory was really cartoonish, but um, John Williams' music... Spielberg directing, you know, you got a lot of good elements going on here. And uh, yeah, I thought that uh, uh, the good guys were pretty sympathetic, so that was good. You, you cared what happened to them. So, uh, uh, the, the entire premise is a little bit hokey, and that thing with the balls dropping, yeah, that was just stupid. That was unnecessary. Uh, it was just a D-Wiz factor for adding to the drama as you wait for the ball to drop. All right, back to net, WB5OZL. Very good. Thank you, Brenda. Now, Tom, KE5ICX, what did you think about the plot of Minority Report, Tom? This is N5BB, after we'll net. Well, thank you, Bill, and uh, thanks for going in reverse order because everybody covered everything I wanted to cover, but that's fine. I have no problems with that. Um, the plot. The idea that, uh, you know, and, and they mentioned this, the, the expository at the beginning goes on and on and on and on. And, uh, pre, uh, it, 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 uh, what is it? preordained, it's uh, going to happen. Uh, I forgot the term right now, but whatever it is, everybody's saying and shouting into their microphone without pressing the push to talk what that word is. But in any case, that there's no um, self-determination, there's no way that you can do anything, uh, except that there is. When given the information, uh, the inside information, somehow or another, you can make a decision, which that alone should tell you that this is a bad idea. But Max von Scheidel came back and said, you know, 
this is a good program. It prevents people from being uh, killed in premeditated murder unless it's not. Uh, and then there's that pesky minority report that gets in the way, and that's going to ruin my career, and uh, it doesn't work, and it's hidden, and all of this. And there's people like the gal with the crazy plants who came up with the program accidentally, on purpose, accidentally. Uh, all those things that make some sense in the sense that, okay, it's, it, 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 it's not going to work. But somehow or another, they sold this bill of goods not only to Washington, D.C., but to everybody in the country that we're going to go ahead and do this. I thought that was a bit much, although I'm beginning to wonder anymore uh, how you could do that and, and get away with it. Well, they didn't get away with it. So that part is a little different. Uh, what wasn't as much mentioned is, is that if, if, you, if you have the chance and you can change your mind, you should be able to do it, whereas in this story you cannot. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, the, there was a lot of the Spielbergisms in it, uh, the crazy stamping inside of the Nissan plant, and the robots, real robots, by the way, uh, doing uh, stupid things. Uh, at least part of it, uh, and, and never shutting off, and you, you, you got to have, of course, John Williams puts the music in uh, here. Include the following. Uh, think about uh, flying an airplane uh, out of a, a Zeppelin. Uh, think about a train and uh, crossing the tr uh, on top of the train. Uh, think about, I don't know, a ball rolling down a hill. All these things play in. Now think about a Nissan plant with Tom Cruise uh, about to be zap stamped or otherwise uh, mutilated by some machine. Cue the John Williams music. That's Spielbergisms, and that's kind of really been overdone even by Spielberg. I agree with the jetpack thing. Of course, this is special effects, but at the same time, that whole chase was awkward. Ugh. I was thinking about that awful scene from Fahrenheit 451 with the, the flying cops. This was the same thing, and it looked just as bad as it did, what, 30 years earlier? So you'd think that Spielberg, but Spielberg probably said, hey, that's a great idea. Let's, let's do it. But now I'm getting into the other part. Uh, getting away, they should have been able, when you have your show of force, when you go in and you're apprehending a subject, uh, you have show of force. You don't go in with ten guys or seven guys, you go in with fifty. And it's Washington, D.C. They should have been able to find uh, a couple of cops. I don't know. Yeah, maybe some, some guards from the Smithsonian or something. Oh, and one thing I was going to mention. I, I, I like Philip K. Dick. Believe it or not, I've not read everything that he's done. Uh, but I have read a few things. Uh, uh, Blade Runner as a book, it's more like a novel more than a book, and the movie, and you compare the two, and there's a lot of scenes that are missing and combined characters in that. And I will tell you this about Philip K. Dick. He liked to drop acid. So some of his stories actually come out as kind of weird, and in, in Blade Runner, they created a whole identical police department, and how that actually played into everything was a bit weird. So it's possible that maybe something in this story, which I've not read as a book, may have been not exactly good, and that may have something to do with it. I'm, I'm treading on on uh, thin ice here only because I don't know what the book is, but. Uh, Dick's stories sometimes get a little weird, so it would not surprise me if it was one of those dropping acid days. Uh, and, and so there may be some differences. I don't know. Or maybe they actually showed up in the story, and that's maybe some of the problems with it. But overall, I, I liked it. There were a lot of plot holes in it in the sense that how can we possibly get to this as a society? Uh, that part I'm, I'm still kind of confused about. But on the other side of it is, it is a whodunit, uh, similar to Blade Runner or Electric Sheep. So I was okay with that. Um, drop about 30 minutes from the film. The stupid chase scene, the long ex exposition that you really don't need. You don't need to do the Dick and Jane thing. People will pick up on it. 
uh, as they did in Blade Runner. They, although when it was originally released, they did do a lot of Dick and Jane. Dropped it, everybody figured it out on their own. Uh, this film could have done the same. Uh, that's it for me. I'm going too long. A KE5 ICX. Thank you, Tom. This is N5BB with the Afterglow Net. We're talking about the movie After uh, Minority Report from 2002. So it's my turn. Um, well, I found the movie moderately enjoyable. So I did not find it boring or bad. But I also didn't really like it. So uh, it's like one of those things that I, I don't really have some big interest to look at again. I don't think I read the story. The last Philip K. Dick story I read was many decades ago when he was still alive. But um, I've seen, I believe, port, parts of this movie. I don't remember watching the whole movie until today. This is in 5BB in the Afterglow Net. Um, I, I don't like real violent movies. So because of that, a lot of this I just didn't like because I thought it was just too violent, unnecessary. And in reality, if the events had happened that they showed you, a whole bunch of people would be dead or in the hospital. And instead, it seems like they were not even scratched up badly. So it, it just kind of glorifies violence and doesn't really show you the true effects. So I don't know. Um, as far as the plot, the whole idea of the precognition thing, I don't like because I think it's all woo-woo uh, non-science. And uh, it wasn't explained in the movie. If it had been explained some way, even semi-scientifically, it would have been better. But it, they just kind of threw it in there. Why were these two twins and this other woman? Who knows? There were other things in the plot that I just did not understand. I, I, I guess I missed why Max von Sydow, the director uh, Lamar Burgess, why he killed the precog's mother. I didn't fully understand that. I understand he did it, but why? Um, they concentrated on so much and other stuff, I missed that part of the plot. So there's a few plot points that maybe somebody else can explain to me that I just, it just looked to me like, wait a minute, you talked about this and that, why did he do it? And I didn't get that. I did not follow that. Another thing about a lot of these kinds of movies is they, they're, they're, they're too binary. I say that in that the people that are bad are just over-the-top bad. They're just crazy bad. And, I don't know, to me, a little bit more uh, of gray would be better than, than that. Another thing I did not like about the plot was the precogs were treated. In fact, at one point, they, they somebody said, don't treat them as human. Don't think of them as human. They were like... Um, I mean, animals wouldn't be treated that way. They were treated very poorly. They were obviously in pain and, and disorient concern. And um, I did not understand that. Well, who would do that? I, I, and nobody seemed to be bothered by that. Nobody was bothered that they had these humans there against their will, evidently, and they were doing bad things to them, and they couldn't didn't seem like they were getting them out to exercise or, or have a regular life. They were just in this tank and injecting them with things. I think that was very inhuman and it wasn't explained. Um, let's see. Another thing, some, some, some plot things. I noticed they had voice control at home. Ah, 
they had something which is here now. But a lot of other things didn't seem proper for this many years in the future. I mean, the uh, the houses look kind of like what we have. The the uh, the cars were weird, but but that's okay. But they didn't. They uh, the the train, the metro looked because it was a real metro plane. It didn't look like a futuristic thing at all. Um, and as some other people have said, the little jetpack things were, I didn't believe them. They seemed a little silly. And um, I don't know, they seemed rather dangerous. Um, and, and the police, this many years in the future, I mean, it's supposed to be over 50 years in the future from when the movie came out. They should have had better ways to apprehend criminal, uh, criminals. They were running around, and he was getting away from them, and they didn't have any any kind of stun weapons or anything at all. So uh, that, to me, seemed very illogical. What else? Oh, there were no safety buttons on the, the, the uh, construction robots in the plant. They were going wacko, and nobody stopped them. What? They should have had either a machine learning vision thing that would automatically stop them, or a human that would push a button and stop them. No, they didn't stop them. That made no sense. Uh, what else? Um, and of course, everybody commented about they didn't re remove Anderton's access. Anyway. And the whole eyeball thing, I think, thought was gross and very unlikely. Okay, into my comments. Does anyone want to check in to the Afterglow Net? We're talking about Minority Report, the 2002 movie. This is N5BB, Net Control. Jim want to make any comments? KF5GBT or W5JWK, if you're still there, I think Chris is still there. You want to make any comments, Chris? Not. Okay, next let's go back and talk about characterization. KG5BZWJ, what did you think about characterization? This is N5BB and the Gastrical Net. This is KG5BZW. Um, uh, first thing, I'm going to apologize. I, I said, I, Authorization, I meant authentication. That makes a lot more sense to my mind because you're trying to authenticate somebody versus uh, authorization, which is actually the thing I was complaining about that was not revoked. But um, I don't know because it's an embarrassing thing to me. I had to apologize for that. But anyway, yeah, the characters honestly are not. Um, uh, what you've got the the, the John Ayrton who you know he, he's uh, the upstanding uh, corporate cop whatever I mean uh, I'm almost drawing uh, uh, like a like Robocop here but I don't know why but uh, because well I do know why but it's uh, a little bit too tangential here um, just that, that he um, believes in the system, and then, of course, at the end, he doesn't believe in the system. Um, oh, well, there's, it's like, really, as far as growth goes, uh, yeah, of course, he gets back together with his ex, and uh, they have, you know, the emotion like he's, like, she's pregnant again, and all that jazz, but I, that, the whole, that whole thing was a little bit contrived. The whole thing is, it's not, there's not, we, we aren't really looking for
for character development because, like I said before, it's an action film. Um, I will agree with, uh, oh, I don't know who said, but yeah, the characters were kind of predictable. It, it, it isn't that hard to, to believe that the big boss from the very beginning is probably going to end up being uh, the um, the, the actual uh, perpetrator of the, uh, uh, well, of several things here. But, um, of course, that's kind of the way the, the, the way the plot is written. You don't really have any, too many alternate avenues to, to go. So it's almost like, well, okay, who's going to be the big guy, bad guy? And like, uh, well, uh, great. Uh, who, what characters are remaining? And, you know, like, it's just, <laughs> there ain't much there, uh, especially when you consider all the action points. So, uh, it, it, besides Tom Cruise playing car, Tom Cruise, um, okay, I guess the, I guess the, 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 the guy that I, I, I'm, that was kind of obvious to be come the bad guy did a decent job and I guess the wife did it was okay too uh, I, but and of course the precog yeah the precog um, had like the very weird situation that uh, you mentioned that you know she was basically treated as subhuman and then humanized kind of um, oh that is yeah the, the more you think about it, the more weird that is, but, yeah, it's true. Um, I'm going to just leave it at the fact that this is, like I said, an action flick, and if you think too much about things, things just get really weird and kind of uh, out of culture. So, uh, that's, that's all i got for now. Okay, you bye, BZW. Hey, Mike. Very good, Jay. Thank you. Next, let's go back to Billy, KFI PDS. Billy, what did you think about the characterization of Minority Report? This is N5BB, the Afterglow Net. Take it away, Billy. Well, I wasn't really bowled over by any character. Um, you know, Tom Cruise's character, you know, John Anderson is the protagonist, and you know, we're meant to root for him, and, you know, he's caught in this web of, you know, deceit and set up by his boss, you know, to prove that the system works. Um, but, uh, and then, of course, you've got uh, Danny Whitwer, who's the federal agent that's coming in to try to break the system, uh, find any flaws in the system that he can. So, you know, it sets up tension, uh, but I wasn't really you know, overly uh, enthusiastic about any of the characters, really. They all are just very, I know as other people have said, they're very predictable. And um, I really don't have a lot to say, I guess. <laughs> um, um, no one character really struck me as, um, you know, any, any standout. You know, they all play together as, like some other people earlier mentioned, you know, the precogs were just these poor, you know, children who had this, you know, incredibly horrific, you know, talent, and they are treated just like computer components. They're not treated like human beings at all. Um, and it's even worse in the story, uh, in the, the Philip K. Dick short story, they're really um, kind of forgotten and buried under tables and things. I thought they were you know, at least in a nice facility, the temple in the story, but in the in the short story, the precogs were just kind of forgotten pieces of machinery, and in the, the book, they were disfigured and not mentally competent. They just had this ability of prediction, and they were just, like, buried under tables and kind of forgotten in some back room, and here they're deified um, as, you know, you know, 
with the, with the gifts they have. And I thought it was interesting when the kids, when they were like doing the DC tour, and the man was talking about the precog, saying that they had their own TV and weight room, and how great it was to be a precog. You know, there's some definite propaganda going on there. People don't know the real story about how the precogs are treated or what their day-to-day existence is like. So I found that interesting uh, from that aspect. Uh, the whole eyeball thing, I heard other people saying how ridiculous that was. Yeah, I didn't find it feasible that, you know, a, an eyeball would last that long for uh, his wife to use it as authentication in a Ziploc baggie for, you know, for it to be out for hours and hours and still be intact. I thought that was pretty laughable um, and gross. And also, I don't know if anybody else mentioned the sick stick. I thought that was pretty sick. Um, that was just gross. Um, but yeah, this, the characters to me were just very uh, meh. I just really wasn't bowled over by any one particular character. Um, so... I really don't have anything to say. I guess I'll throw it back to you. This is KFI PDS back tonight. Very good. Thank you, Billy. Now let's go to Sean, KB9SOQ over in Fort Worth. Sean, what did you think about the plot? Excuse me. Characterization. We're on that now. What did you think about the characterization? in Minority Report. This is N5BB, the Afterglow movie. Take it away, Sean. Yeah, this is KB9, that's okay. Uh, yeah, well, actually, speaking about part of the plot, a part that I kind of forgot to mention was, yeah, the whole precog thing they mentioned, you know, early in the movie about, you know, why can't they see simple crimes? They said because it has to be you know, a crime of extreme situation, you know, life-threatening, and uh, and that's the only way they can see it. But yet, during the scene when they're leaving the mall, she seemed to be able to predict every little tiny thing that was going to happen, from, you know, the rain to, the, you know, how they could be blocked so they couldn't be seen. So I thought that was a little weird. I, I forgot to mention that earlier. So that, that was a kind of a big plot hole there. Uh, yeah, the characters were, you know, I think, you know, everybody's already said it, not very memorable, really. They were pretty much by the numbers, very flat. Uh, you know, Tom Cruise's character is definitely him, uh, just kind of classic his character. Once again, I, I don't think he's the most dramatic actor, so, you know, I never really felt that it really pulled hard at my heartstrings at different parts. It just seemed like places he was overacting, didn't seem, you know, legit, so I wasn't overly impressed with that. Um, the, 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 the federal officer, you know, he, of course, they were trying to lead you down a path that he was actually the real bad guy, but in reality, he was just trying to find loopholes because, you know, they thought this wasn't right. And But he, even his character was overplayed and over the top because, really, I would think if an FBI agent was really going to investigate something like this, they would be very methodical, very, you know, detailed, and when it, you know, just kind of being just a real, you know, like he acted, I don't want to say the word on the radio, but, you know, it just didn't... Uh, it just didn't seem to fit what a real FBI agent is. Um, yeah, and really probably maybe the best actor or actress was really the precog, the lady precog. I mean, at least she seemed to show emotion, and you could see that she was in pain, that this wasn't a pleasurable thing. She really just wanted peace. Um, so for me, she was probably the strongest character in this whole film. Uh, at least I felt that was maybe felt real legit. Um, the, the The caretaker... Uh, he was just downright out creepy. I mean, obviously there was more going on there what they showed, but they definitely, uh, yeah, he just seemed really creepy. So, that, yeah, once again, as, as you know, as mentioned earlier, it seems like if this was the case, these people would be much, much better to take care of. You know, even if the fact that they didn't think they were humans anymore, that fact that they were just an invaluable part and they would want to make sure they were well taken care of, and they really weren't. And there was, like, no third-party monitoring of any kind of what was really going on. And, you had this supposedly high-security prison, and there's one guard, you know. <laughs> and then, yeah, the police officers felt like were kind of laughable because, once again, if these were, like, you know, they kind of see anyway, these guys were, like, SWAT kind of, you know, trained, but yet they couldn't, you know, apprehend one guy. You know, they start out all going after him, then they go after him one at a time. You know, it just, yeah, it is, you know, obviously they didn't have any technical people kind of showing them how a real SWAT team would 
approach that. It just, just the whole thing was. I'm just really surprised for a Spielberg film that it was, it was wasn't a little better laid out and and uh, it wasn't more thought out through and and, and you know maybe he just didn't have enough material to work with. But uh, I'm just surprised uh, by that. Uh, the you know the, the ultimate bad guy. Yeah, he was typical ultimate bad guy. He's played that kind of character before that actor, uh, and it was okay, I guess. You know, um, you know there was actually a lot of pretty well named actors in here, so I was a little surprised it wasn't a little better than what it was. But once again, if the material's not there, it's not there, um, kind of deal. So, so yeah, it's unfortunately not much else to say other than that. Back to net control. This is KB9. That's okay. Very good. Now, let's go to Brenda, WB50ZL. Brenda, what did you think about the characterization in Minority Report? This is the Afterglow Net in 5BB. Go ahead, Brenda. Thank you. This is WB50ZL. Uh, I thought it was okay. Um, Tom Cruise is Tom Cruise. There's a reason why he's a highly paid star. He's, he's good at it. So... He plays Tom Cruise in every movie, but that's okay. And some of the characters are a little hard for me to keep track of. Some of the cops, as to who was who and and why and so on, and and some of them I didn't quite understand. Like the the attendant at the pool, um, he was kind of creepy. If if I were the supervisor there and I saw how he behaved, I'd probably replace him. And there were just a lot of people that were a little bit wacko. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, on the whole, it was okay. I have no complaints uh, overall of the characterization. And uh, I'd like to go back and read Dick's book and see how it compares. I believe it wasn't quite the same, but I don't know. I'd like to go back and read it and see what what his concept of this was. All right, back to net, WB50ZL. Uh, very good, Brenda. Thank you. Tom, K5ICX, it's your turn to talk about characterization. This is the afterglow net in 5BB, net control. Go ahead, Tom. Still, this is KE5ICX. Um, let's see here. Uh, a couple of things. Um, we, we, uh, he, you know, our main character here, which is uh, John Anderton. I, why can't they just make him Anderson? What is Anderton? I have to go look up and find why they use that name. I guess it's a name, but in any case, uh, a cruise plays cruise. And I was thinking uh, in another film uh, directed by Stanley Kubrick, and he has a scene with Sidney Pollack in it. And uh, it, uh, it involves um, simply standing at a pool table, and they're discussing back and forth, a tit for tat type of thing. And, what, and, and Stanley Kubrick has a tendency to do the same thing in all his films. He lets scenes run too long. And Tom Cruise ends up acting the same way with the emotions, you know, the irony, the irony, you know, the hands in the air, the big smile, the angst, and then the laugh, and then the, uh, the you're wrong type of thing. This is what he does in everything. And he did it three times in that, in, in that one scene. It, there was no development. It, the, the point of the thing was the dialogue back and forth between the two actors, and it, 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 the two characters, and that did not happen. When I, I started doing this thing, it's been a while since I've seen him in a movie, uh, I kind of felt uh, that scene playing over and over in my head is Tom Cruise, every scene is the same, and the same uh, uh, level of acting, the same level of expression. There's no nuance. There's, there's no depth. And I think if he is the lead in this, and he helps to set the mood and mode for the film, the other actors got nothing to go with. They really don't. It's not to say that he's bad. He usually picks pretty good projects to do. The problem is him more than anything else, that at that time he had not grown as an actor. I've not seen him 
recently, so I don't know if that's happened or not. But he, he, he you know, jump on a sofa up and down and see what happens. You got Tom Cruise. That's it. So what you see is what you get, and that's probably what happened. Uh, Max von Sydow was okay in it. He's playing Max again, like he always does, somewhat of the methodical uh, and sometimes maniacal. In this case, uh, Lamar Burgess. That was uh, he was okay. Um, character wise, I agree. The precog, uh, the gal, was probably the best actor in all of this. She, the uh, character in this, in, in that she had emotions that, that mattered and suggested there was more there than met the eye. But then again, we, we moved away from it uh, towards the end. So, But they did leave, leave, live happily ever after. Now, I want to go back to the plot a little bit because I was reading here and there were some comments that I thought were very important. You remember in uh, what was uh, uh, now I can't think of the film right now. Um, well, I can remember the book title is so you can remember it wholesale, which was the um, um, film. Oh, jeez, it just went out of my head. Okay, well let me go with uh, Blade Runner first because I can remember the name of the darn book. Uh, but uh, of the story, but in any case, uh, that did not have a happy ending, if you remember. It did in the original uh, motion picture version, but then they reversed it uh, later on for the director's cut and all that, and it was an unknown future for Deckard. Uh, there was also, doggone it, the Arnold Schwarzenegger thing on Mars, whatever it was called. Uh, everything was was uh, imaginary. It was uh, in his head, or was it? We were never sure. Well, here we go. Maybe this is what happened with the Halo. Total Recall. Thank you. Somebody just sent me a back channel. Is Total Recall? It was a Total Recall. We don't know. But uh, in in this case, when when uh, Anderton gets put in the the Halo, uh, just beforehand uh, the caretaker tells him that you can do whatever they they can do whatever they want they can live their happy lives it doesn't matter they're out of society and they're here with us and everything is is fine and he plays the, the organ and does all of this stuff and what do we get we get a happy forever ever after story that uh, that Anderton gets out, he finds his wife again, he has another kid, they, they are forever happy. Is that how it really ends? Maybe he's still in the halo. Who knows? But if you say that explicitly, you have a very unsatisfactory ending to a story. So it's maybe up to you. I don't know. That may be too subtle for a Spielberg film, which has a tendency to hit you in the head, bonk, bonk in the head, and tell you stuff. So probably from Spielberg's standpoint, it's not subtle. Because I don't think so. Well, Spielberg did do uh, Schindler's List, so maybe it's now. Well, even that one's pretty overt. I don't know. I'm thinking out loud. But it would be interesting. That might be an interesting uh, slant to the story. Um, rest of the characterization, characters were, were fairly well uh, portrayed as they were, but again, I agree with what others have said, it was a little bit on the flat side. Uh, Colin Farrell was kind of interesting in an early, in this early, in an early role for him. Um, uh, I, yeah, I'm looking at this long list of actors that were in this, and I was not overly impressed with performances, which is Kind of, I don't know, a bit odd for a pricey movie like this. All right, uh, back to you, Bill. Thanks for doing the net, too, KE5ICX. I'll put it on account. Um, you can pay me back later. Uh, this is in 5 bb and the Afterglow net, and it's my turn. That's right, my turn to talk about characterization. Well, as others have said, the... The most sympathetic character was Agatha, the female precog, 
played by Samantha Norton. Look her up. She was a really very popular, well thought of actress back uh, 20 years ago. So, uh, yeah. Um, she did a really pretty good job of playing, well, everything. She could play limp. She could play uh, scared. She could play sweet. She could play excited. She could yell at the top of her lungs. She could do everything. And none of the other actors in this displayed anything like that real range of emotion. They tried to get Anderton, John Anderton, to do that, but about all he could do, I think, was incredible rage and incredible sadness at the loss of his son. That was about it. Um, the other characters didn't seem to have any good emotional life. They were horrible. I mean, they were all horrible, just essentially all of them. So think about the guy that was that was the one down in the the, the uh, temple that who was uh, keeping all the three precogs going. He was a real kook. Think about the people, the guy that was in charge of where they stored the criminals in that machine. He was a super kook. A, cr a super kook. Think about the guy on the outside that was the the uh, backyard doctor, the back door doctor, that changed out his eyeballs. And think about his assistant. They were both over the top. I mean, um, uh, just not just over the top, way over the top. So what I think is I think <clears throat> when they wrote the screenplay, they purposely de decided to play these things as a bit tongue-in-cheek. So I think that whoever was originally involved in the screenplay may have thought that this was kind of a, they were kind of uh, sticking their tongue in their cheek, and they were kind of... Uh, <clears throat> um, purposely showing you things that couldn't possibly be real, that were over the top. It's a little bit comic book-like. It's so, you know, over the top. Uh, I mean, the whole scene of the eyeballs going around and popping around. And, and, you know, something else that shows you how over the top he is, for some reason, he takes the eyeballs out of the little uh, zipper pouch. And what do they do? They fall, they fall down and roll down the incline, and he could gather only, capture one. <laughs> you know, that's a caricature of all this. So I think a lot of this was not intended to be a realistic story. It's kind of like a fairy tale. And... Uh, the 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 uh, I think that the uh, the screen the author of the screenplay kind of thought, hey, we're going to put one over on you. We're going to make you think this is a story of something that occurred in the future, but we realize it, it couldn't possibly occur. So we're gonna, just going to throw some wild things out there. And Steven Spielberg, of course, loves to film those crazy things. I mean, who really be believes some of his other films? <laughs> They're over the top. Anyway, this is inside BB. Um, so anyway, um, Max von Sydow. The moment you saw him, you thought he's got to be. He's the guy in charge. He's got to have a bad, 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 bad history. He's got to be evil, 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 just because of the nature of the kind of actor he is, you know, and the kind of people he plays. Anyway, okay. So much for the characterization. Does anyone else want to check in? I see JJ over there. Um, JJ asked me on the Echo Link if he th did, did. Did I think the script was written to have William Shatner play every part? No, no, no. <laughs> okay. 
Um, now, let's go for the final things. Let's try to close up by before midnight. We don't have to go long on this one. Uh, so we've talked about anything else you want to talk about. The special effects, the eyeballs rolling down, the uh, the robots in the uh, auto plant, the weird, poorly shown cars that went sideways down the buildings, the, the little jet backpacks, um, anything else you want to talk about, special effects, music, directing, um, anything all. Let's go back up to the top of the list. Let's go to Jay, KG5BZW. What do you think, Jay? This is KG5BZW. Um, okay, yeah, you, okay, you, I forgot about the eyeballs. That, that was actually one of the other things that the original just handling of the eyeballs was just that was I, I I I just could not believe he was handling it that <clears throat> that roughly the, his pair of eyeballs that roughly went in, and of course he particularly dropped it and blah 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 oh that was a silly scene um, but anyway I, I'm not going we've already covered a lot of the the, the issues with uh, certain uh, aspects of this world and the scenes. Uh, so I'm trying to avoid that. But, yeah, that. Anyway, <clears throat> the, um, I actually like the cars. It's just a new, it's a different way of looking at how we could travel, possibly. Um, I mean, yeah, I don't know what you would need to have a uh, cars going up a vertical highway like that, but, uh, I mean, if it can be done, that's, that's kind, of, kind of a cool thing. I mean, they had rotating, uh, uh, uh not cockpits, but, um, well, the area within, the, the pasture area within the, the vehicle. I, I, I was I was inspired when I first watched that, um, so I was like, yeah, that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, I mean, whether or not it's, it's real, I, I, at that point, it's, it's more cool factor than, than whether or not it, it can actually be done. Um, uh, let me see. I, I kind of, I think even as even back way back in. 2002 when I first saw it, I thought the, the separate uh, optical elements that kind of relate to, you know, our, okay, we got the VHS tape for, you know, his birthday and the VHS tape for blah, blah, blah. Well, what do we have right now? We've got, you know, uh, iPhones and, and mobile devices that can store how many hours of uh, three uh, of stuff, and yes, in fact, even 3D pictures, although not 3D movies like they were that were shown, but uh, basically have IR scanners that uh, that uh, do that kind of uh, thing that the, that the uh, that was being shown and generate images that way. Um, uh, I'm I went off the rail there. Um, so it is kind of interesting to show, to see what, how technology has evolved since then. And it's like, oh wow, there's that, there is actually 3D uh, cameras, but they're like right now they they aren't quite motion, but picture. But I mean, they could be. It's, it's not really. It's it's basically it's just that this is it's not really nobody really wants that. Um, uh, okay. Uh, Let's see, um, oh, I don't know, score, I don't think, guess it, it was one of those things that the score is not overpowering, and uh, it, it wasn't memorable, but it seemed to, to, to it, it 
did seem to compliment whatever I heard, which I can't remember honestly, but it did seem to, to compliment what was being shown, so um, I can't complain there. Um, I really can't remember anything else the special effect wise besides, I mean, there's, yeah, the grossness of it all, the violence and blah, blah, blah. Um, oh, yeah, the, the hover, obviously, the, the, you know, hovercraft, I'm calling them hovercraft, they're not hovercraft, they're the future, uh, oh, uh, magic floating craft, that's what I'm trying to say, I just don't know what to call them. I would call them hovercraft, but, you know, we have hovercraft that aren't like that. Um, those are kind of, uh, yeah. I, even if the police scenes were very awkward, and they were, um, no doubt, uh, even without the, the, the uh, rocket uh, gear, that was some very awkward police. Or they, there's no reason... Tired and should have been given a chance to leave, to leave that, like that, but um, whatever. It, it, it's like yeah, I, I knew when I watched the film, I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to turn certain parts of my brain off, which not really, you know, but I knew I, was, I wasn't gonna have to be uh, terribly critical, so I, 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 I think I knew that then. I knew that. To, uh, Whenever I watched it last, which this week, I guess it was Friday. Um, I, I did probably, I, yeah, we, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I, I'm keeping y'all, oh, uh, <laughs> keeping this net, oh, live probably a little bit too long. Let me switch it out. I, I, I'm, I'm done. Hey, kg 5 EJW. Billy, KD, KFI PDS, what did you think about anything at all? Last call. Uh, go ahead, Billy. This is N5BB. Yeah, I, too, liked the cars. I thought they had a cool kind of light cycle look, like from Tron. That's what they reminded me of. Um, I liked the, the way they docked on the side of the, like his apartment when he arrived home, it like docked and opened and he just stepped right out into his apartment. I thought that was really awesome. Um, I liked the tech in the film. I thought that the computers, the way that uh, he manipulated things with his hands, uh, you know, kind of like motion capture glove or something, I thought that was really neat technology. I liked it. it was kind of, I guess, holographic in a way. You know, they had those sliding panels, and they could just load things up onto them, slide them out, slide them into another computer. I thought that was pretty nifty-looking technology. I thought that would be super cool to have one day. Um, I liked the 3D camera, kind of holographic 3D uh, setup he had in his house when he was doing his home movies. I thought that was really neat. Um, I also liked the computer-generated plants in Dr. Henneman's garden. It reminded me a little shop of horrors, you know, she like helped genetic, genetically engineer these children, you know, to become precogs and uh, through that, through the, her experimental program and here she was at home experimenting with plants and had the one guarding the garden, you know, when he leaped over and it lashed out on him, caused him to hallucinate and everything. Um, and she had the little ones that were kind of darting around, and she was just cooing and petting them, and, you know, it, just, it was creepy, but I thought it was a neat, uh, uh, you know, just kind of a, it reminded me just a little shop of horrors. I just thought that was really a, an awesome touch, because they were like characters, too, you know, and she just had this awesome greenhouse, you know, with all, just all these plants, but, you know, some of them could lash out and attack you, you know, it just was... Uh, really creepy, but I thought it was a, a, a neat touch, you know, in, in that vein, um, to see that, um, I think they think, I always love the ending scene, uh, where the precogs got to live their life in peace, and they were so remote that, uh, it was just go a gorgeous ending scene, probably one of the most gorgeous ends to a movie, um, besides Twister, Twister had awesome 
thunderstorm image, but Jan Devon also did that movie, so he had something to do with this too, so I don't know if that was his touch or on both films or what, but the, about that end scene where they just pulled back from the cottage, and then you just kind of lost them out there, you know, <laughs> if you didn't keep your eye on where they were, it was very easy to lose them, and the, the just the end scene was just so beautiful, um, it was nice to see that they got a happy ending and could live their life out in tranquility, um, which I know is probably nothing like the book. I don't remember much about the book, but uh, I thought it was a nice way to end the film. Um, and yes, Samantha Morton is an awesome actress. Um, she's in many different films, uh, probably the one of the weirdest and most beautifully, beautifully weird films is The Next Key in New York, if you're not familiar with that check that one out. She's really brilliant in that film, as is Philip Seymour Hoffman. So uh, that's not a sci-fi film, but it's a great film to watch anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, I, this is a movie I'll watch if I'm in the mood for it. But uh, I like the tech. I just thought that the tech was really neat. Um, music, uh, as Jay pointed out, was not memorable. There's not like a memorable theme that you could instantly think of when you think of this film, but it was very appropriate for the action. So uh, enjoyed the music as well. And that's about all I can think of, so I'll throw it back to you. This is KFI PDS, back to next. Very good. Uh, thank you very much, Billy. Let's move ahead to Sean, KB9SOK. Last comments. Sean, this is Inside BB, after Gonet. Yeah, this is KB9 S OK. Um, yeah, it's as I mentioned before, kind of covered this that yeah, there was definitely some some bad tech in this or bad uh, special effects. You know, the 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 jump packs or jet packs and the uh, you know even like I mentioned earlier about the eyeballs dropping and rolling. The I thought it was weird. But I was watching that scene because when they actually dropped, they actually sound like a rock hitting the ground. Uh, and I don't think your eyeballs would actually be like a marble and, and, and bounce and, and make those sounds. So it's kind of weird uh, there on the special effects. Uh, the little glass or glass discs that were supposed to be memory storage, yeah, that, that was very popular in, in the 90s and the early 2000s for movies to use glass. You know, there were circuits and, you know, uh, it's anyway that they're crystals and, you know, and that is a potential future of storing information in crystals. But, uh, yeah, that, that's been kind of done. It was okay. Um, the, the, I do agree, the cars were probably the neater part of the movie. Uh, I did kind of like uh, that part. I did think that was good. You know, the, the 3D hologram thing is, you know, pretty neat. Uh, so there, there was a few good effects. Uh, the factory scene, which was mentioned earlier, um, I've worked in a production environment before, and usually there's photo eyes everywhere. So as people said, uh, most likely the production would have just stopped had it detected, you know, you know, an object where it shouldn't be. Um, so that part wasn't really particularly thought up. Once again, they want, did it for the visual effect and to look cool and uh, what have you. Um, I, I would have actually think I would have liked the movie better had it followed what uh, I think Tom mentioned about the, had they kind of left you thinking that maybe he just imagined all that, the ending. Um, I, I think that would have been actually a pretty neat alternative. And, and I, I think that would have been a, a kind of a cool ending had they done that. Hadn't even thought of that thought, actually. So that, was, that was interesting. Um, and then, you know, Bill made the comment about the over-the-top, you know, maybe it was intentional, and maybe it was. I hadn't thought of that either. Um, but then, but I don't know if that really helps me like it any better. Uh, when you take a movie like Total Recall, where everything was over-the-top and the characters were over-the-top, I still actually very much enjoyed that movie because it just fitted. It seemed right. Uh, and, and, but this movie, it just seemed like it was, it just broke it up and made it kind of difficult to watch at times. Um, but as much as I've kind of beat up this movie, <laughs> you know, it was still okay. You know, it, it, it's still an okay movie. Um, but uh, it's just not one I, I would think I would watch over and over. And as far as Steelberg's movies, it's definitely not one of my favorites. Uh, but anyway, back to Net Control. This is KB9. That's okay. Thank you, Sean. Let's move ahead to Brenda. WB50ZL. Last comments, Brenda. This is Inside BB at Net. WB50ZL. Um, oh, 
I'm tired. I think I'm out of ideas. I just don't think I have anything that I didn't say already. So uh, I'm going to quit there. I'm sorry. WB50 said L. Thanks, Brenda. Tom, last comment. This is N5BB after Globet. Thanks, Bill. Uh, I was going to make a comment. I only had really one, and that was the vertical highway. Why would you want something like that? Uh, let, let's just assume that in the year 2054, the population has continued to grow, and you have to move people back and forth. We haven't developed transporters and all that stuff yet, so what do you do? Well, you take the highway, and instead of going underground or around buildings or demolition, you just have the highway go over the top of the building and back down. I think that's exactly what was discussed, or, or, or what was suggested, not discussed, but I think was suggested with these vertical uh, uh, transport things that you see in, in the thing, with the cars going up, across, and down. That's all that is. You create a highway by just going around the obstacles, and that includes vertical. So other than that, that's, that's really all I had to say. Uh, special effects-wise, uh, they were, I thought, pretty well done, except for the thing that we were talking about with the jetpacks, which is a real fail. And of course, the assembly line, the, the, the Lexus plant. Oh, one thing I was going to mention about, though, is really interesting, is there's lots of product placement in this thing. Lexus is one of them. The Gap is another. Uh, malls. Malls have made a comeback in the year 2054, so much so there's a bazillion million people walking around. That I found interesting. But the thing is, is that why are the logos in the distant future or the near future where there's product placement, why are they perfect? Why are the same? Uh, even it, it, when you do uh, uh, future NASA and that, they stylize the logo and improve it. But I guess that's because they're paying for this for the space. Uh, that always drives me nuts. The Gap Gap logo hadn't changed in 50 years, so that's just me. That's it, Bill. Ke5 ICX. Okay, Tom. This is in 5 BB. My turn. So, uh, with regards to what Tom just said, you have the logos. So we have, you know, in the movie, as they were walking through the mall or other places, public places like that, the ads were coming, um, you know, all the time, kind of like Blade Runner. Um, but um, in reality, we have the same thing. It's just done more subtly because if it was done like in this movie, nobody would put up with it. So what do we have? Occasionally, my Amazon Elvis, smart speaker will come on and say, we see you haven't ordered those unsalted nuts, uh, you know, 52 ounces recently. Would you like to order them now? Just tell me, and I'll be glad to order them automatically for you. <laughs> my speaker just says this to me occasionally, and I get emails from Amazon.com saying similar things. We noticed in the past that you were looking at these things. Wouldn't you like to buy some of them? So uh, we really have some of that kind of technology right now. It's just done a little more subtly or we would go crazy. Um, so what, final comments by me. I think that the, the problem I have with this and other directors and uh, uh, producers trying to make science fiction related movies is they're not brave enough. What does the bill mean by that? Well, they're not brave enough to talk about philosophical themes, which is really what authors like Philip K. Dick and many of the other ones, great science fiction authors, we're trying to bring up with philosophical themes, but they're not brave enough to do that. So are they talking, do we really get people concerned with how these three humans are down in this tank being treated so inhumanely? No. Did they really, so they weren't bringing that up as a philosophical theme. They should have. 
somebody in the movie should have been concerned about it. They should have been waving a sign outside or sending, you know, messages or something. No, none of that. They should have talked to their their loved ones about it. No, none of that. Um, there was no talking about the philosophical theme of are things preordained. So this is something that's actually controversial in physics, is physics seems to think that time is bidirectional. In other words, there's no nothing that shows exactly why time would not be symmetrical. And because of that, and because of things involving general relativity and special relativity, it appears that Things in the future are all, what we think of as the future, are already going to occur, just like in this movie. Uh, did they really talk about that in a more serious philosophical way? No. All they talked about was this precognition thing. But they didn't talk about the philosophical aspects, really, of uh, things in the future being possible to change or impossible to change. And that's the thing that I think is the loss. The, 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 the people doing the movies are unwilling to be brave enough to talk about those big themes and make them of concern, have people have discussions about it, you know. Tell, tell us what's in their head and they're thinking about these things. No, they go for action. They go for action, they go for goofy characters, they go for all this other stuff. That's what bothers me. There's just such a lack. And, and the movie about Mars the, with Arnold Schwarzenegger, that was one of the worst ones. I saw that, mo that book. So there was a paperback book that came out six months before the movie came out. And I saw it in the Irving Public Library. When I was looking at things, this is in BB. So I checked it out, and I read it, and it said, you know, major new, you know, movie going to come up, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. So when I read the book, I thought, this is way, way, way too violent to be made into a movie. I was just sure of that. And then I saw the movie, and I thought, this is even more violent than the book. It's, it's, it was, to me, horrible. And... Um, you know, I don't want to live in a future that's that violent, personally. So, um, anyway, that's my thoughts about those things. Okay, last call. Does anybody on Echolink or anybody in RF want to make any final, final comments before I close this net? It is six minutes after 12. This is inside BB, uh, Afterglow Net. Last, last, last final call. Why not? Kilo, India 5, Juliet, Charlie, Mike, Thomas, and Ulysses. Go ahead, Thomas. What do you want to say about after the minority report? I just wanted to check into the net. All my points have been made. I think it's idiotic about the eyes. She got his eyes back. She got his gun back. And subhuman treatment of the precog. And they, in fact, they totally blurred over it. I'm not a fan. KI-5, JCM, back to unit control. Thank you. Does anybody else want to make a comment before I close the net? Well, JJ didn't even write a hilarious comment on Echo Link. So I'm closing in that now. Bye-bye. No more. Phoenix. Tom, what's coming up next week? This is in 5BB. Go ahead, Tom. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for doing the net. Uh, next week's movie, Radius, from 2017. Science fiction thriller film, Dead People. Well, maybe. Uh, it's a Canadian science fiction thriller film. Uh, it's Canadian, even. Maybe we can get uh, Frank involved. Uh, just send me an email if you want to, the link so you can find it free streaming this week, Radius. Uh, send an email to Kilo Echo 5 India Charlie X-Ray, KE5ICX at Yahoo.com, or join the Afterglow Movie Net 
group at after uh, on Facebook, which is Afterglow and Movie Two Words, and uh, just say you want to sign up, and you'll get the links there as well. Back to you, Bill. Bye. Ke five ICX. Okay, Tom. To be clear, you're talking about the 2017 movie Radius. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. 2017 Canadian science fiction thriller. Okay, and I'm assuming you'll send the email out like you normally do to those of us on your list. Thank you very much, Tom. And I'm glad you sent out the link to the Amazon Prime thing. I watched it on there, and I just had to watch their upfront Amazon Prime ad, but I didn't have to watch any other advertising in the whole movie. I really appreciated that for those of us that have that perk. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Inside BB Clear, good night.